members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Council of Ministers, good afternoon and welcome back to this public meeting of parliament, the public meeting handling the draft budget for the country 2024. During the first session of this meeting, we heard from all of the ministers present information, some by virtue, in fact, all by virtue of a presentation regarding their ministry's budget as included in the draft national ordinance country budget 2024. We adjourned for lunch to come back and immediately start with the questions by members of parliament, which, as you know, will go according to an indication from the members on the speaker's list of parliament that they wish to take the floor. So far, we have, as the first speaker in this session, MP Akim Arundel, who I invite now to take the floor. MP Arundel, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being present today. Thank you, ministers, for today for the presentation. I would drive straight into the questions one time. Um, I don't have much questions because maybe it's around two. But um, for the first question is to Minister of Finance. Can you provide, can you minister provide Parliament with the update of the tax reform and what is the current status and what are the timelines? Number two, a lot has been said about compliance and collection, whereby taxes have increased compared to 2023 budget and by 42 million dollars. I would like to know whether there are any update on discussion between the government and RTS. Can the minister please give me an update on the new stickers that have been provided instead of the new plates or the current figures to compare with last year rural tax payment? Why is it not possible to request for tax exemption structure anymore if the law is still in the Council of Vice? Why is the structure removed? This is question for number Mr. Romy. It's a question that my my MP asks, MP Kevin McGrath, is a question to relate to the serious traffic problems on the island. Uh, I wonder the minister can give me some kind of outline or medium or long term to address it because, to be frank, the people of St. Martin need more roads, I must say, because we don't have enough roads. What is the plan and process to, to from the, I think it's Dutch Quarter to St. Peter's, the correct, and also the order from Margaret to St. Peter's? As an only question, honestly, from Minister of Tourism. The following question is about the tourist tax. Um, how, will it, how will it be implemented? Will it be placed by the airport or harbor? Will it, will it be by the departure hall, the arrival hall? Who is getting its revenues from the tax reform? The government or the airport or the harbor? Will the tax include in the, will the taxes be included in the tickets? Um, what was the private sector consultant regarding this tax? And where can the public view this law? And also, this is a statement for either the incoming government or coming in. During Christmas time, we see the lack of Christmas decoration. Yes, we have wrong about um, decoration, I believe. I believe that we as a government should provide more for the country of St. Martin, for the people in St. Martin towards the increasing of Christmas spirits to the island. People want to see more liveliness. I also believe it should be in regards to celebration of St. Martin Day also. I understand that times are hard for everyone, but we should try to at least give back to our people of St. Martin. Let's just take an example for our neighbor islands for the front side, how beautiful it was for the Christmas, how they were light up. Um, come on. Minister of Finance, Mr. Vesa. I don't have much for you, only one question. Pertaining to the minister, I have received different complaints from therapists that they continue to receive payments from SVB Lane. Are you aware of this? And if so, what do you do to address 
this matter. Um, Minister of Justice, are there any plans put in place to ensure the safety of everyone during the carnival season, especially seeing that what happened during the jump up, such as street lights and extra pay for the officers? And um, also, once again, I have to spotlight this minister. Are there any um, anything for the fights for upper the school, the camera for districts? We have protectors to protect our students. And also, like we saw by the Ebenezer side there, by the playground, if people vandalize in the playground and all these things, if you could pour a spotlight up there. And also for three, I have noticed in the up um, coming for the new prison, also does not include any girl, any girls under the age of 18. What will be done for the for this group? They have no um, cells. There are also no institutes put for minor female penitentiary detention for serious crime. When will this ha when will it be handled? Are there any plans between the Minister of Justice, Versa, and Education to tackle the lack of social institutions or troubled youths? And what are the temporary solutions? That will be all for now. Thank you, MP Arundel. And as I look to my left, I see that our next speaker is MP Kevin Mingret. MP Mingret, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Pleasant good afternoon to your honorable ministers. Pleasant good afternoon to everybody in the Tribune and to my MP colleagues and everybody who's watching via social media platform. Through you, Madam Chair, I have a couple questions posed to the ministers, starting with the Minister of Romy. The ministry has reported the completion and progress of several housing projects. Could you inform us of the income range targeted to these social housing initiatives? Additionally, is there a rent to own option available for potential homeowners? Within the allocated budget of $8.6 million, are there plans to construct new roads? If so, could you outline these plans? With respect to road repairs, are there specific plans to implement proper drainage systems to address the long-standing issues of water accumulation? To you, Madam Chair, this is question posed to the Minister of Justice. Turning Point has disclosed a funding of 1.55,000 USD dollars. Would it be possible to provide a detailed report on the allocation and expenditure of these funds? Does Turning Point cater to both men and women? Furthermore, are there plans for expansion focusing specifically on services for women and young girls? Is Turning Point the sole organization offering assistance for substance abuse? If not, do other such organizations also receive government subsidies? And could an alternative strategy be expanding existing services instead of Turning Point? Can the minister indi indicate what percent of the 26 million slated for administrative costs for UNOPS? To you, Madam Chair, this is a question for the Prime Minister. Can you provide an outline on all NRPB, the start date of projects, guiding ministries, commitments, and the remaining balance per project? To you, to you Madam Chair, this is a uh, question for all the ministers, and my last question is, could each ministry provide a current update on the status percentage of financial commitment fulfilled for all their cap capital expenditure, the CapEx project? That'll be all, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, MP Kevin Maingret. Members, we still have the speakers list open. Niet allemaal tegelijk, please. Don't.
We continue with the speakers, the members of parliament, according to the speakers list. And I give the floor now to MP Melissa Gums. MP Gums, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady, and good afternoon to you, my colleagues, we fear the ministers joining us today, their support staff, those joining in the Tribune, and uh, the people joining us online or via different mediums. Madam Chair Lady, <clears throat> I'm going to try to go in the order that the ministers presented, since I think that makes it a little easier for their staff to mark any questions uh, necessary. So starting with the Ministry of Finance. And through you, Madam Chair Lady, the minister mentioned that uh, in the 2024 budget, they included the divestment of winner shares. But in reality, um, after answering my question in the Central Committee, it appears that we're still at the start of the road to selling off any stake in Winair. My statements here are not just for the minister, but also for the general public, because of course, since it was included and talked about, the public themselves had a sort of panic reaction. Um, I can agree with the minister that divestment is a suitable course for the country to explore, because there's a certain level of pride that comes with total ownership, but ownership also comes with responsibility. And when you're a small economy, sometimes sharing that responsibility becomes necessary. I would not have necessarily mentioned specifics of the potential sale of Winair, of Winair shares, because what's done is, like I said, sending certain pockets of the population into confusion, and unnecessarily so, mainly because numbers attached to these types of deals are not normally discussed when still at exploration stages, because now people are asking, well, what are you going to do with the 13 million? But it's entirely possible that after the due diligence stage is completed, the partners involved decide they don't actually want to dance together. So that's just a word of caution to anyone, actually, in the future <coughs> discussing such potential deals. The one question, um, Madam Chair Lady, that I do have for the Minister of Finance is whether government was exploring alternatives to Moody's. Now, this was not a PFP faction question, uh, but unfortunately was included under our section, so it caught my eye. Uh, the minister responded to this question about our sovereign credit rating, that St. Martin had ended the relationship with Moody's, and gave the reasoning as cost-cutting measures being in effect during COVID, which is, for that time, understandable. However, having that data and that oversight of our sovereign credit rating is critical, uh, since it evaluates our credit risk and gives an indication of our ability to access funds and pay said funds back. So I just would like the minister to explain <coughs> if there's been any move to restart the relationship with Moody's or any other sovereign uh, credit rating agency. Moving on to, I think it was justice. Um, Madam Chair Lady, while there were many hiccups along the way, and while I and many others have disagreed with the methods and sometimes the language used in getting to where we are right now regarding the justice function books, uh, it cannot be said, Minister, through you, Madam Chair Lady, that you haven't done significant work towards resolving the issue, so kudos to that. The reality is that funds are always going to determine what is possible, whether it's function books, whether it's building something, et cetera. But with that being said, I do have one question. Consistently, it seems as though the ministry is increasing cuts to courses and training while simultaneously allocating more funds to, for example, staff bureau. So I'd like just to know the motivation behind this because I think anyone working in that chain, CAPSM, et cetera, can argue that investing in continuous training is critical. Now going over to the ministry of VSA, Madam Chair Lady. I don't have any questions today for the minister, uh, mainly because the one question that I do need answered cannot be properly answered until a methodology is found to identify the expenses as well as the income of the increase of the ZV wage cap. As the minister explained in Central Committee, there is currently undergoing how to change the format to allow for this comparison to be able to be made. Because the challenges St. Martin is facing regarding healthcare, funding healthcare, are also impacting other islands and indeed larger countries. And it's going to lead to some difficult discussions in this country that the incoming government and even after that future governments will have to face. Because a small economy, we are held back by the fact that healthcare and the funding of it largely depends on numbers. <clears throat> then. Moving on to the Ministry of Teat, 
uh, because I do not have questions for ECYS right now. Uh, Madam Chair Lady, I think the minister may have sensed me coming for his inclusion of US preclearance in his Central Committee presentation because I see in the one received today that it is not uh, really prevalent. I was going to ask why it was included in the first place when the State Department itself told the Prime Minister that for the foreseeable future, it's off the table. But it was taken out, so I'll bypass my question on that point and go instead to the Minister's notes on environmental conservation, beach access, and safety. How do, and this is something that I think we've talked about almost to exhaustion here in Parliament and in the various committees um, of Parliament. But how do the Ministry of Tiat's policies, which again are highlighted here, on these points coincide with the Ministry of Rami and their issuance of rental agreements on, for example, our beaches? Uh, over the last few weeks, um, you know, there's been the very careful and piece by piece placement of a new container on Mullet Bay Beach, for example. And as of Sunday, March 24th, we now see uh, it has evolved to varnished wooden chairs being placed in front of what, albeit, is a very stylish container. When you look at Mullet Bay now, for locals who maybe do not want to pay for chairs or who enjoy carrying low to the beach, they're usually at the back, under the trees um, that they can be under. I myself has witnessed with, um, businesses on Mullet Bay telling people they cannot set up chairs and umbrellas and even volleyball nets in areas that are outside the square meterage in the rental agreements issued to them. So how have these two ministries, uh, after this time, and I know, Minister, you're like the third, fourth Minteat that we've had, work together to regulate these encroachments on local access to the beaches? And for the Ministry of Rami, Madam Chair Lady, <clears throat> I asked most of my questions during the Central Committee, but perusing the answers that we received from government in writing has brought up just a few more. Firstly, and most importantly, since the knowledge of the Didam arrest, have there been any new issuances of long lease land by this outgoing minister? This would have gone against the conditions set forth by that verdict to begin with, Madam Chair Lady. And some might argue that any advice for new issuance coming from domain that is positive would automatically be against those same conditions as well. So I'm curious to hear the answer, particularly because the verdict stated that a policy for issuing land, something this faction has hammered on since 2020, must first be established and put into force before issuances continue. Is the minister going to be personally held responsible for issuances given out in contradiction to the verdict? Remains to be seen. One of my primary concerns as well, Madam Chair, when it comes to the Ministry of Rami, has always been consistency and the ability to properly execute projects under the principles of good governance and management. When we look at the capital expenditures planned for wastewater solutions, et cetera, I know residents are looking forward to this, but I would like the Minister to outline what, if any measures have been discussed or implemented to prevent what happened in Dutch Quarter from happening again with that EU-funded project just to be clear. One answer provided uh, between actually uh, finance and Vrami, Madam Chair Lady, was slightly contradictory. So in one part of the budget, 17 million gillas has been allocated for a wastewater treatment facility in the KB area. But in the answers to questions asked about sewage issues, et cetera, it then says that the 17 million will focus mainly on, yes, that wastewater plant, but also expansion and network and house connections in areas where there exist in sewage lines and also the upgrading of the sewage plant located at Etielid Road. So I just want to know which is it and if it is both, how is that 17 million divided? Beyond that 17 million Gillaway's water treatment plant in Quebedo, there should be some consideration given to future developments and whether developments are paying their fair share for the strain brought onto our infrastructure. And that is what I was missing when the minister came to parliament in January 2023 to present a spatial development strategy and plan, a policy which he admitted is not binding in the first instance, but also not one where fees are being considered for that infrastructural strain. So I just want to know if that has been discussed at all since that time of that um, strategy being presented. And my final comment, Madam Chair Lady, uh, regarding the so-called Lands of Ordnance Vrami, National Ordnance Vrami, which uh, in the answers is explained as an umbrella ordinance under which all other ordinances and other legislative pieces will fall that are related to Vrami. This, um, to my recollection, has been in the works for more than a year and change now. Um, but to my knowledge, nothing has yet been sent to the Council of Advice, so if the Minister could update Parliament as to what stage in the legislative process this particular piece is at, 
so the incoming minister can know what awaits them. <clears throat> and lastly, for general affairs, so Madam Chair Lady, as the last presenter today, I just want to thank the Prime Minister as well for her presentation. Um, and before I get into my remarks, I just want to touch on something that the Prime Minister mentioned regarding uh, resilience and how persons are tired of hearing that word. There is a reason for that exhaustion. Um, and to explain that, I just want to quote from a 2022 thought piece by a young St. Martin student currently doing her master's study in political science. The resilience mindset is a mindset that has taken a new form after Hurricanes Irma and Maria and exacerbated due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The idea of the island being a resilient people has been the response when we question why certain systems aren't put in place or why we aren't making efforts to improve the systems. Resilience is a term used for people who have to deal with circumstances that are seen as undesirable by many. To the global community, what we are going through fits that lens. As a society, we praise people for living through, not overcoming tough circumstances. Scholars see this as a policy and a scholarly issue. Cannon and Mueller Mann state the notion of resilience, whether derived from natural ecosystems or technological usage, is dangerous because it is removing the inherently power-related connotation of vulnerability and is capable of doing the same to the process of adaptation. What this boils down to is that the resilience mindset keeps people in survival mode and never sees them evolve to a state of overcoming their reality. And governments play a big role in whether or not that evolution takes place and people move from resilience to actually thriving. For my remarks on the answers received, Madam Chair Lady, and the presentations repeated here today, I have to say in reading the answers, I was a bit flabbergasted by the response received from GEBE to the questions and statements made in Central Committee regarding the current grid market MOU between the country and grid market. The response they gave was GB is not a party to the government and grid market MOU. Therefore, GB has not entered into a partnership or consulting agreement with grid market. But when the Prime Minister announces an engagement like Grid Market with a specific task of plotting a roadmap for the country's renewable energy journey, I know the population, like myself, assumed that GB was party to this as the only company with a concession to generate electricity for the, company, for the country. So it makes sense that they would be the company that would be following the roadmap developed by Grid Market. And then in Central Committee, I asked, is it essentially the same trajectory that we're developing an energy roadmap for the country? And the comfort I got from that was that, yes, that's essentially it. But then GB kind of counteracts that by saying that they're pursuing the NRPB track, and then government is pursuing the grid market track. So I just want to know which one is it, and was GB involved in the discussions leading up to and after the signing of the MOU with grid market? Because from what I read in their response, it's like a no. And then I have a question through you, Madam Chair Lady, for the Prime Minister regarding the COLA adjustment that was highlighted right before the start of campaign. Um, it was mentioned by the Minister of Finance that the legislation to justify this adjustment was done, but um, when you, Madam Chair Lady, actually stated that we hadn't seen anything in Parliament, I believe the Minister said the Prime Minister would verify its status. I uh, could not find that verification or documentation received, so if the Prime Minister could provide it in this meeting, that would be much appreciated. And finally, um, Madam Chair Lady, and this is just a comment I make because PNO falls under the responsibility of general affairs. My colleague, MP De Weaver, um, asked for some critical information from each ministry, namely the leavers and joiners data when it came to employees. Most did not provide the information, uh, whether they have it or not, or did not provide it accurately. And I think MP De Weaver will expand on that a bit uh, when she takes the floor. Um, a former MP, now outgoing minister, and soon to be full-time MP, infamously said in this hall in 2020 that data don't matter when XYZ is happening. It took quite some time for this government to realize that data does, in fact, matter, and it is actually very often the only thing that matters. Not having on-the-spot data regarding leavers and joiners of an organization makes me wonder if government is actually doing exit interviews for when people leave to be able to keep proper track. And it doesn't help to just keep track of bodies in the building. It helps keep track of devices, access cards, and other items that should be returned. In my previous job, for example, after the former prime minister famously shut off postpaid cell phones from government, I encountered someone who had left government in 2012, but in 2018, his bill was still being paid by government. 
But aside from identifying possible leakage of funds, the primary purpose of exit interviews and proper HR practices by actual HR professionals can identify trends in personal behavior and productivity, and that helps with accurate budgeting for personnel. So fixing these data gaps will hopefully be a priority for the incoming government. With that, Madam Chair Lady, I yield the rest of my time and I'll await the responses to the questions asked. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. And we continue with the speaker's list, and I invite MP Grisha Heiliger Martin to take the floor. MP Martin, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Lady. Good afternoon to our Secretary General. Good afternoon to the ministers, my colleagues, and a few of you in the Tribune and those listening and viewing online. Madam Chair Lady, I just have questions for three ministers today. Your one, yes. Starting with you, Minister <laughs> Yes, three ministers, just a few questions, actually some clarifications based on the final report that we received. And of course, yes, I will be starting with the Minister of Finance and Madam Chair Lady with regards to the cadaster, mainly that. I've listened to the Minister of Finance during the Central Committee meeting and read his answers in the report. I want to remind the Minister through you, Madam Chair Lady, that of that letter I sent via the Chair on July 5th 2023, stating my serious concerns about the financial viability of the cadaster and aforementioned handling of the organization by the minister and supervisory board. I have the letter here. Well, yes, I have it. I have it with me printed. The reference of that letter is UV slash 204 slash 2022 2023. And I don't recall receiving ever a response to that letter. And Madam Chair, based on that and the answers providing by the, provided by the minister during the question hour, as well as the, as the information provided to my colleagues and I during that closed door meeting with the managing board of the CADASTA last year, I am now even more concerned and convinced that something is seriously wrong when it comes to the manner in which the minister and the supervisory board has dealt with the CADASTA and its managing board for the past few years. This includes flagrant breaches of corporate governance principles where the supervisory board oversteps its authorities and attempts to assume the role of the managing board. Based on the answers provided by the minister, I conclude that in addition to the questionable timing of the reappointments and regardless of the advice of the corporate governance council, there appear to be conflicts of interest with at least two of the current members of the supervisory board. I also concluded that the minister seems to have retroactively used a legal trick to allow what technically is a second reappointment or third appointment of members of the supervisory board, using this legal trick retroactively, annulling appointments and making another, another appointment allows government to reappoint supervisory board members and reappoint them infinitely. My next conclusion is that despite the Projected, net projected negative financial ramifications for cadaster to hire a CFO and a COO, as mentioned in my letter of July 5th, the recruitment process has continued and will be finalized soon for the CFO. Madam Chair Lady, through you, in order to get more clarity on what exactly has been going on at the cadaster, and with reference to its articles of incorporation and my letter of July 5th, 2023, I hereby request the minister via the supervisory board or otherwise to provide parliament with the following information for clarification purposes. Through you, Madam Chair, Lady, can the Minister of Finance please provide uh, parliament with the written legal advice based on which reappointments of the supervisory boards took place? The reasons there were, there was a need to reappoint members of the supervisory board effective April 1st, 2023 in the first place when it was well known that their term would end on March 30th, 2023. And the minister therefore could and should have started the recruitment process in a timely manner. And also provide information, a written, written substantiation of the supervisory board to recruit a CFO and CEO, COO and the opinion and advices of the managing director to the supervisory board on this matter. My next question through you, Madam Chair Lady, I'll leave it at that for the Minister of Finance. My next question through you is regarding, is to the Minister of General Affairs. Clarifications for the most. After reviewing the answers provided, 
I have a question for the Honorable Prime Minister, and it's regarding my inquiry to whether there has been an increase in the fuel throughput over the last decade. According to GB's response, the statement, they stated no, to the best of their knowledge. However, this response has left me a bit perplexed. My first question is, was the Port of St. Martin contacted to assist with some of these questions? Yes or no? Because as far as my research entails, the port's fee, throughput fee, is less than one cent, 0 0.0044 to be exact, and that has maintained that price fixed for the over 10 years. That price has maintained like that for the, for the over 10 years. Therefore, I reiterate my query. Has there been any escalation in the fuel clause over the past 10 years? And if so, how is it possible that there has been no increase in the throughput fee while there has been an increase in the fuel clause? If this hasn't been increased, in the, if there hasn't been an increase in the throughput in the throughput over the past 10 years, then Prime Minister, through you, Madam Chair, Lady, why was there a claim that the fuel clause increased due to port fees? That's the one clarification I have. My last set of questions is to who else? The Minister of Tiat. <laughs> Madam Chair, Lady, through you, I'd like to ask the Honorable Minister some questions because I still some of the answers provided in the report was still a bit vague for me. And one of those was about the Met Office, the Civil Aviation Architectural Drawing that was funded by um, the National, um, the NRPB. Could the minister, through you, clarify, clarify its relevance to the Princess Juliana International Airport regaining its Category 1? Is there any relevancy in that? If the building construction is linked to the airport's Category 1 um, rating, and what percentage of, uh, what percentage of significance does this particular infrastructure hold in achieving and maintaining that desired rating? Could the minister through you, Madam Chair Lady, provide a comprehensive breakdown of phases, steps, estimated timelines for the completion of the Met Office, the Civil Aviation Building Project? Additionally, can the minister please provide the proposed budget allocation for this project? I think I have it already, but still state it for the record, if please. And who owns the land on which the Met Office Aviation Building will be constructed? And has the cost of the land been factored in to the cost, total cost of the project? Are we leasing the land? Are we buying the land? Are we getting the land for free? I just need some clarity there. Regarding the new market vendors place, another thing that was pretty vague for me, the last we heard, there was just two signatures and something, 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 and then it was a bit vague for me. So I have a few questions here, specific questions. What steps has been, take, has been undertaken thus far for the development of the new market vendors place? From site selection to the completion of the architectural, architectural drawings, obtaining a letter of intent, intent and commitment for the opening and launch. Has consultations been held with all existing vendors regarding the new marketplace vendors, the new uh, marketplace? How many vendors will the facility accommodate? How many vendors have been approached? And what level of interest have they expressed in securing a location in the proposed venue? Regarding the commitment, the committed tourism product improvement plan, another subject. What specific strategies or initiatives are included? And how do, how do stakeholders plan to ensure its successful implementation and impact on enhancing the visitor's experience. Additionally, could the minister through you, Madam Chair Lady, provide details on the allocations of the budgeted 2.5 million guilders, including which activities it is committed to? Furthermore, how much of the capital expenditure, expend the capex then, was already committed and spent in 2023, specifying the projects involved? And lastly, Madam Chair, my last question for round one, Madam Chair, is, is there a comprehensive plan in place for each project within the improvement plan? Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Grisher Heiliger Martin. I continue with the members of Parliament and I invite MP Roseberg to take the floor. MP Roseberg. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you, Madam Chair, Secretary General, Honorable Ministers. Thank you for the presentation. My dear colleague, MPs, all in public um, and the ones viewing online. I have a few um, questions based on the answers I have received um, in the um, meeting previously. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I have the following questions. My first question is to all the ministers. I have nonstop been hearing that um, there is a lack of legal expertise. Um, what is the current government doing or have been doing to attract legals to government um, so that this can be tackled, the legal expertise? My question um, to you, Madam Chair, for general affairs, um, I requested um, to get an answer if GB has a hindrance, hindrance permit. I have not received that answer. The Ministry of Romy, um, I requested a list of roads um, that are up for upgrades. I received a list, but that was in regards to the side roads while I referred to the main roads. So I would like to receive that list. Now to the Ministry of Justice, through you, Madam Chair. I have um, received the answer that uh, was given to my colleague, MP um, La Cruz, in regards to the court cases. Um, and I have seen that most of the court cases are in regards to justice. Um, so my question is, what has the Ministry of Justice been doing to be able to settle the matters outside of court, um, seeing that there is a trend of cases being lost, resulting in a huge amount of um, cost, extra cost, um, that has to be paid to the opposing party, seeing that in 2022, for example, um, it was an amount of $65,000, of 65,000 dealers, excuse me, and 2023, about 21,000. Also, I have um, seen different articles in regards to the Justice Boot Camp, but I haven't seen it on the budget. Um, so what's the reason of that, seeing that it has been um, spoken about several times. Also, um, in reference to the interview through you, Madam Chair, on Lady Grace, in regards to um, the question if, it has, if the ministry has been working on the criminal procedure code, I um, understood that it was mentioned at the hands of parliament at this moment. Um, and then in regards to the the punishments, because it was in regards to, if I'm not mistaken, um, the abuse cases and the punishment, and the, 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 the punishment needs to be higher, and it was referred to as hands, in the hands of parliament. But the criminal procedure code does not handle with punishment, so I would like to have um, clarification which part in connection to the punishment is in hands of parliament, seeing that procedures um, don't deal with punishment. So if that can be clarified as well, um, then I have questions through, the, through you, Madam Chair, um, in regards to the newly appointed Secretary General. Um, I would like to know, uh, based on um, what qualifications the Secretary General was appointed, because I um, did some research, and according to the research that I did, the function you need to have a master's degree um, are um, master degree in law or something connected to it on a universal level um, or that in that field she has, um, that person has proved themselves being equipped to do the job. Also seven years management experience um, in law. So I would like to know based on what um, that was done and if that is the case, if that can be provided to parliament. Um, were there others that applied for that position and um, why the conclusion was made to choose the specific person or was there only one person that applied? Um, if that can be clarified as well so that that's clear. Um, I also ask in regards to the um, amounts allocated to the justice and anti-counterfeit conferences, um, the amount of 250,000 guilders. I requested a specific breakdown. I haven't received that breakdown, so um, I would like to receive that breakdown. 
And again, reasons, because I'm seeing that there are um, a little commotion happening in regards to the Secretary General. Why I'm asking that question is because I got feedback out of the community that there were others that also were interested in applying and they haven't received um, or weren't aware of that function being available. That's one. Other than that, um, I would like to know and get clarity on that so they can ask in the second round specific questions in regards to that. So it's nothing um, against who have been appointed, but just to seek the clarification in that matter. Um, let me see. Then also in the presentation, it was mentioned that um, police officers on the French side of the island will also be operating on the Dutch side. I would like to have, um, get a reaction um, based on what legal be basis that will be happening through you, Madam Chair. That's in regards to um, Carnival, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then in regards to the tackling of the school fights, again, I'm still by the Ministry of Justice. Um, in the presentation, I uh, understood that the ministry stated that it's at the till, um, justice serves as the till at the end of the matter, but um, and primarily is being focused on enforcing the law and also keeping order. But um, what is being done as prevention, because I'm of the opinion that prevention also plays a big role. So what's being done as prevention? Also, um, I'm continuing a radio interview with Lady Grace as well. Um, the ministry mentioned in regards to the carnival events that a positive advice was given on the permit. I would like to receive a copy of that permit to um, review that as well. Um, in connection to the victim support system, um, is there already um, salary being paid um, and to the director or other workers? How many um, workers are connected to this victim support system? Is there currently a building and is there rent being paid? If so, for what amount? What is the estimated rental based on the articles that I read? Supposedly, um, it should be um, opening its doors in March, but we're in ending of March. So is there already a building and what is the estimated rent? The Miss Lally Center is a youth detention center where um, youth between the ages of 12 and 18 um, need to be incarcerated. Um, my question is to you, Madam Chair, are there currently youth being incarcerated in that age bracket? And if not, why not? Where are the youth currently being detained? And um, what is being done, but I understood that my um, MP colleague Mingret also asked that question, and MP Arundel as well, in connection to the minor girls that commit a punishable act and uh, what is being done with them at this moment because seeing the recent fights that we have been seeing, um, it came to my understanding that after a few hours they were released. So my question is, um, is there something in place for them? And if not, is there a policy in place in the near future to make sure that that is also being tackled? Um, which improvements are being made to the Ms. Lali Center? Um, the facility is in need of a behavior specialist to monitor the progress of the minors and the mental, emotional, and psychological state. So um, I would like to know um, what is being done there. Seeing that um, we currently have a court mandate, there's a court mandate, for example, for an inmate to receive treatment um, as a pay maatregel, um, but we don't have the facility to make sure that that pay maatregel takes place. So I would like to have clarification on that. Now questions in regard to the crime fund. Um, in the central committee meeting, I asked for the SOAB report. I did not receive that report. Up to now, um, I would still like to receive that report. Um, also, my colleague MP Emmanuel requested for a breakdown of the funds. Um, those the documents were submitted as a confidential document. My question is why were those um, documents submitted as confidential documents? Um, I would like to ask through you, Madam Chair, to receive um, those figures, not as a confidential document, but as an open document, I would assume, if that's possible. 
Um, also, um, based on the review of that document, I, it came to my understanding that payments were being made um, for an inmate or a person in Brasami and that it was paid via the crime fund. I'm trying to understand why was that done, seeing that the crime fund has been established to tackle crimes. So I would like to have a clarification on that, uh, why that amount was used to transport or to house someone in Brasami. Also, based on Article 5 of the law of that crime fund, it states that on, on a yearly basis um, that there should be um, a plan submitted to make clear what kind of projects will be um, implemented in that specific year. I have not seen that plan. Is that plan there? If it, that's the case, I would like to receive that as well through you, Madam Chair. Um, and why hasn't the crime fund been, um, why can I not see that on the budget? Or are there certain funds that are on the budget that are connected to the crime fund? These are my questions for the Ministry of Justice through you, Madam Chair. Then for the Minister of Education, um, um, ECYS, through you, Madam Chair. Um, um, it was pretty shocking to see that um, there are no prevention programs um, or initiatives currently in regarding to the current school fights, seeing the, the current increase in numbers. Um, and that based on my question, it seems that the ministry is currently waiting on the trust fund managed by UNICEF to tackle that matter. Um, if that's not the case, I would like to get it clarified what is being done currently to tackle that matter. Has the ministry um, ever looked into the concept of Brede Buurtschool, so broad neighborhood school, um, being that various organizations work together with the school and parent on the development of children, organizations like child, child care, welfare, playgroup, sports, culture, neighborhood police, libraries, or other institutions, a holistic approach. In connection to um, the question that I ask uh, in regards to the education versus the, the policy in the schools and the connection to their hair length, um, I would like to understand through you, uh, Madam Chair, how it's possible that the ministry allows or accepts or um, doesn't prevent someone's education to be refused by a school based on a policy, um, that same school that the ministry is giving subsidy um, because their hair is a few inches too long. Um, doesn't the ministry should play a stricter role seeing that education is compulsory? Um, the swim team, the question that I asked in regards to the swim team, did the swim team finally get um, answers to the subsidy um, that was submitted two months ago? I also um, studied and listened carefully to the presentation that was provided to the, by the minister, um, but then I look at the budget and I'm not seeing on the budget the, the priority list that it includes provisions needed to support and further develop the special education based on newly created special needs education policy. How is that possible? So my question is, what is the ministry's plan in the execution for the special needs education policy for the upcoming three, six, 12, and 18 months? How will these developments be reviewed and measured? How will the stakeholders, being the parents, schools, third party, organizations be involved during this review process? Has there been any discussions with 7 to 1 Foundation in, regarding, in regards to providing support for the special needs students, or will the ministry's action remain reactive instead of proactive for our students in regards to the special need? With the yearly open house and sports expo created for much needed exposure for our art and sports organizations, um, I believe there need to be more structure to support those students and empower them to become financially stable. Like many artists say, we cannot pay bills with exposure. What policy will the, policies will the ministry be providing to guide, develop, and protect local artists, athletes, and organizations with the field of arts and sports? What are the ministry's program for 2000? 24 and 25 in collaboration with UNESCO. 
Has there been any discussions and initiatives with the Ministry of Finance and TIA concerning taxes for entrepreneurs in these fields? What is the status of this youth policy and its implementation? What will it entail? How will it be executed? What are the measurements, measurement tools and review methods to be used? Who will be involved in the review and measuring the policy effectiveness? Will the youth policy also include youth care? How will the ministry collaborate with the Ministry of Justice concerning juvenile justice and affairs? And how will the ministry collaborate with the Ministry of FASA concerning positive health practices? Those were my questions for the Ministry of um, ECYS. Ministry of FASA, through you, Madam Chair, what um, in connection to community development, family, and humanitarian affairs? What are the budgeted in initiatives for this department? How many are employed and what are their tasks? How is community development being measured? Are the objectives or pillars that the department aims towards? What are the um, objectives or pillars? Are they visible in the communities? Um, does the CDFHA do outreach work and how is it organized? Also in regards to my question um, mentioning the involvement of justice in the, the cannabis project, um, as a reaction, I received that there is a ministerial regulation. I would like to receive the copy of this regulation. My questions in regards to the Ministry of Teat, to you, Madam Chair. Um, my question was related to the, the bus permits and the new taxi permits. Um, and as an answer, I received that um, the moratorium policy on public transportation licenses was updated in September 2023. And my question is, what's the reason it was done in that period? Was it in any shape or form connected politically? Um, seeing that the article that I have read in the past of the ministry, of the minister um, Otley, that there is no opening for the moratorium. Uh, why now in 2023 was it open? And um, can I receive that, um, policy based on what it was opened, um, who decided to open it and based on, on which reasons. Those are, um, that's a question in regards to that. And then if I continue, Madam Chair, um, in regards to the conference with foreign investors interested in St. Martin, how does they protect um, local investors first? What type of foreign investment topics are being presented? Do these pro um, promote local jobs, local businesses, and local artists? Do they provide options for locals to invest in? In connection to the economic affairs, what is the investment percentage of local investors and foreign investors? And what is the short, long, and short-term and long-term plan to develop Phillipsburg? Three months, six months, 12 months. What initiatives are being executed specifically? within Phillipsburg? Has the ministry investigated creating social and performance spaces in Phillipsburg for tourists to get an experience from our local artists? This can be a collaboration <coughs> with the other ministries as well. What specific initiatives and programs are budgeted for the stimulations of inclusion of artists in tourism and economic? What policy is being used to include, stimulate, and support local artists within our tourist industry. I thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my questions in the first round. Thank you, MP Roseburg. I now invite MP Christophe Emmanuel to take the floor. MP Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to everyone. I only have a few questions, Madam Chair. So I'm going to dive right into them. Madam Chair, I'm going to start with the Minister of VSR. But we already had a little discussion concerning some things I wanted to ask him. 
and Madam Chair, through you, it's mainly pertaining to the hospital, coming back to it again. I know the minister is stuck on his timeline when he believes it's going to be complete. But in that discussion, something came up, and I start to think about it. And minister, through you, Madam Chair, to the minister, it's concerning the hilly part. I know you didn't elaborate a bit much on it, but you also made mention that in this construction, there's going to be a helipad. I would like to know if the hospital itself is going to own that portion of the helipad, and if the answer to that is yes, then the next question would be, do we have a helicopter to be used for this helipad, and who owns that? And what will be the cost if it will be at the tune or owning by the hospital or the government of St. Martin. Also, Madam Chair, I would want to believe that the helipad and with the helicopter is for emergencies. So then you're talking about evacuating people. But there is no other location on St. Martin besides the airport that it can land on. So what are we looking at, Minister, through you, Madam Chair, when the other serious accident is from the road or wherever it's at, ambulance picks up to the hospital, and then from the hospital to the airport, if the individual have to be flown out. Mm -hmm. So they'll be flown out through that way. You know, in certain places, because of emergencies, traffic backed up, the helicopter can land somewhere, get the person on board, and rush them to the hospital one time. I don't think that is the use of it, because there's nowhere else on the island that it will be able to land. So I'm trying to get a gist of the use of the helipad and the helicopter for what it really will be used for. I also want to know, does this tie in also, Madam Chair, with the medical alliance that all the islands now is part of? Would we be evacuating people, not evacuating, but would we be bringing people also from Sabre and Stacia, okay, on in, in emergencies? And who will be paying for that? And what's the cost of it? So what I'm trying to get at, Minister, through you, Madam Chair, is the real cost, one, and the use of the helipad and the helicopter and whoever all is going to be using it and what the cost of it would be. And then a different question to that. Do you believe that vaping and vaping products should be banned in St. Martin? And if your answer is yes, can you elaborate why? If your answer is no, can you also elaborate why? Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I also have a few questions as well for the Minister of Justice. I would like to understand, Minister, through you, can you give an explanation on all that it takes to grant a permit for an event? What all does it take? Because listening to your radio interview, you said there is a different, there's a number of individuals or institutions that needs to be taken into consideration. For example, the police department. And you need to look also at if there's going to be any sort of emergencies or anything that can happen. So I would like to know, what does it take to grant a permit for, for an event? The reason why I'm asking that question through you Madam Chair, is there were a group on the island twice asked for a permit to protest the war in Gaza and Israel, and it was denied twice. The reason why I'm asking that question, or once, whichever way it is, listening to the minister, the minister said she's not in the habit of denying permits. What would be the reason for the denial permit? So that's why I'm asking the question. So on one hand, I listened where a permit was granted for an event, and a permit was denied for a, another event, for a protest march. So I'd like to ask, you know, what constitutes granting of a permit? And I think my colleague Shamida asked the question too as well, why are these documents confidential? I always have an issue with having these confidential documents. Madam Chair, 
Based on these answers, I would have more questions for the minister in the second round, but I would like to hear what the answers would be, if there's clarifications, and for the second round. Madam Chair, I want to go over to the Minister of Finance. Minister, can you explain or can you sort of give an explanation what it is that constitute the central bank giving dividends to St. Martin? How does that work? Because the chair lady one time said, if you're going to give dividends, you must be able to give it from having something. So if dividends is going to be given to St. Martin, and this is in relation to the Enia saga, what it is, or how is it, that dividends will be given to St. Martin? And also, Madam Chair, when was the last time the central bank gave dividends to St. Martin? When was the last time St. Martin received mm -hmm. dividends from the central bank. And if there's a period of time within the last two years, three years, five years, can you give the amount that was given as well? Madam Chair, also, when it comes to bearing point, is there a court case to the tune of 20 million? That bearing point, I'm asking the question, that bearing point will be levying against the government of St. Martin. If the answer to that is yes, can the minister explain the reason for that? Why would bearing point be bringing a monetary case against the government of St. Martin? What would be the reason of it? Also, Madam Chair, coming down to the end, the World Bank said that, <coughs> sorry, the World Bank said that they will be taking up office space in the central bank here in St. Martin. I would like to know, Madam Chair, to the Honorable Minister of Finance, are they paying rent for that space in the central bank? And if they are paying rent, how much is that rent that they will be, or that they are paying for the space in the central bank? Now, Madam Chair, I only have, I don't have no questions for education. I don't have no questions for Tia. But I have a few questions for the Honorable Prime Minister. And Madam Chair, it's for educational purpose why I'm asking this specific question. And if you would permit me, Madam Chair, I would like to play a sound or a video from the Member of Parliament in the Twitter camera, Hyde Wilders. I would like to play it, Madam Chair, if I would get the permission for that. Acknowledge that Islam is an influential ideology that fosters hatred and terror, and as a result, is not compatible with the values of the Netherlands. Close our borders right away to asylum seekers and immigrants originating from Islamic countries. We should withdraw from the Schengen Agreement and reintroduce our own border controls. 3. Begin by dismantling Islamic institutions like mosques. Start by closing foreign-funded mosques, including those that receive funding from abroad and are under the authority of Dianet, the Turkish Ministry of Religious Affairs, and not us. 4. Lock up anyone who threatens or uses violence or deport them from our country. And if necessary, take preventive action against those hundreds of supporters and thousands of sympathizers of the jihadist movement in the Netherlands. And five, Chairman, request all schools, newspapers, media to display a Mohammed cartoon. In order not to provoke, but to demonstrate that we never give in to threats and violence and that we proudly and firmly support our freedom. Finally, I have a message for all those Muslims in the Netherlands who do not respect our freedom, our democracy, and our core values. Those who consider the rules of the Quran more important than our secular laws, and there are many of them. 700,000 is revealed in the study by Professor Koopmans, and my message to them is get lost. 
depart to an Islamic country, then you can enjoy Islamic rules. Those are their rules, but not ours. This is our country, not your country, but our country. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, Madam Chair, I had a discussion and it went into an argument because the individual was saying, we are part of this. And I was telling him, no, he's talking about the Netherlands. And the individual said, yeah, but we are part of the Netherlands. And I told him, no. The reason why I'm asking this question, Madam Chair, through you, can the Honorable Prime Minister explain what's the difference between <clears throat> the Netherlands, Holland, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands? And which one of those states is St. Martin a part of? Because, Madam Chair, we have a mosque in this country, and we have Muslims in this country. And we are peaceful with everyone in this country. That's why I want to know, because I would want to believe when the Netherlands is being mentioned, they're talking about Holland, or uh, that part of Europe, not Aruba, Curacao, St. Martin, and the best islands. I would want to believe, Madam Chair, that we are part of the kingdom of the Netherlands. So that's why I'm asking the question. Can the Honorable Prime Minister explain what's the difference between Holland, the Netherlands, and the kingdom of the Netherlands, and which one of those states is St. Martin a part of? Also, sticking with the Prime Minister, Madam Chair, this issue, <coughs> sorry, with Telem is still sort of disturbing to me. So I want to ask the Prime Minister, Madam Chair, can the Honorable Prime Minister explain what was the reason for Telem buying cable TV? What was the reason for that purchase? And how much was that purchase? Madam Chair Lady. And if that purchase of cable TV was to acquire the infrastructure of cable TV, I would like to ask the Honorable Prime Minister, is the infrastructure of cable TV being used today? And if it's not being used today, how much is the loss on the books? Why I'm asking that question, Madam Chair, is because when I had a discussion with the Honorable Minister of Finance in purchasing Mullet Bay, he said, yes, it could be purchased, but we can't, if it's purchased, there must be a plan. And I agree that within a certain period of time, a production or whatever it takes can go into Mullet Bay where we can recoup monies because we can't have such a debt on our books. Now, Madam Chair, when I pass through that area, cable TV is closed down now. Nobody in that building, the building just there, the infrastructure, the satellites, everything is just there. I would want to know, is not a debt also on the books as well to tell them? So I would like to know, Madam Chair Lady, what was the reason for tell them purchasing cable TV, closing it down? What was the reason for not using the infrastructure if it's not being used, yes or no? I would like to know also, Madam Chair, what is the cost that was paid for purchasing of cable TV? Also, Madam Chair, <clears throat> I received a question from one of my colleagues to ask, and I know that, my, that one of the colleagues also made mention as to preclearance being off of the books. But I would like to ask the Honorable Prime Minister if they have any intentions whatsoever in terms of going after preclearance. But for me, it's a question I wouldn't ask, because I don't expect the Prime Minister to be there much longer. So I wouldn't be asking that question, Madam Chair. However, there's where they are, so I'm going to ask the question still as well. And also, Madam Chair, is it so that the U.S. did pull back? And what are the reasons for that? I thank you very much, Madam Chair Lady. I'll await these answers, and I'll prepare much more for the second round. Thank you.
Thank you, MP Christophe Emmanuel. Members of Parliament, I continue with giving the floor according to the requested speakers list. And the next one up is MP Lutmila de Weaver. MP de Weaver, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Lady. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone as well. I'm going to keep it brief because uh, based on the final document that we got from government with the answers of the questions that started in CC, um, I can comfortably say that I have two and a half ministries that gave me the right information that I needed for the personnel movement. Um, I have now changed my graph in accordance with what was uh, recommended and provided by the Ministry of Finance. So I, with your indulgence, Madam Chair Lady, I'm not going to go over the same things again because it's very simple information that I'm requesting, but I will send it back again in writing. It's the same graph that I asked about personnel movement from the year 2020 to 2023, um, and I've, I've made corrections and, and I've made notes of where the information is lacking. So all it requires is the budgeted plus actual personnel in accordance with the comparison of the function book. Um, so moving on from that, it, I just have actually one question for the Ministry of Finance, Minister, through you, Madam Chair Lady. Can I continue? You may continue, MP De Weaver. Yeah. But let's just let no me. Problem. Prime Minister, you wanted to make a comment. Was it in regard to you wanted to answer, you wanted to ask some? Excuse me? Yes, unfortunately, it is. <laughs> no, but you know what, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I did, I did actually go over it very uh, quickly because so it's the same information again. Okay. But so what yes, I, what I can do is uh, clarify it based on the exact information that, that sure. I need, okay. um, which is fine for me. Uh, I, I, I will ask the public to have patience with it because it's just a bunch of numbers. Basically, the information that I asked for was, ex was explain and describe by line item by the Ministry of Finance where they provided the budgeted versus the actual figures of personnel movements for the years that I requested. So 2020 to 2023. And what it is, is the formation book, so a function books exist basically for all the ministries for those years, except for, as we all know, the Ministry of Justice, because they just finalized it last year. So that information would be missing for the Ministry of Justice, obviously. But for the other ministries, the amount that they have, the amount of personnel that they need per the function book has to be compared with what they actually had budgeted for in the beginning of the year, what they had at the end of the year, and whether or not there was massive differences between what they really truly needed per accordance with the function book. So I hope that helps, Madam, I hope that helps, Madam Chair Lady, with the Prime Minister. But again, it, nothing has changed from the initial information other than the fact that the Ministry of Finance was very helpful in providing detailed line items. That's why during the lunch break, I was able to get it from two different ministries that I know now it's complete for three out of seven ministries. TEAT and ECYS provided the information, but they, it looks like it was unprecared, so it was swapped around with the actual columns that they needed to be in. So once I have that, then I can actually give the rest of my questions, because if I don't have the information of staff movements, my questions won't make any sense. So I need to have a full picture so that it could actually help visualization for everyone else to understand that if we are every year budgeting for 200 persons, but all we could afford is 100, that's what we need to see. And if those 200 persons are actually what we need per the function book, then we're going along quite fine. But what you see across the board for the ministries that are correct is that everyone needs more staff, but we can't afford more staff. And so I need the complete picture. That's why I said I will provide the full details, adapt it again, and hopefully the third time around, I can get the right information. Um, moving on to the Ministry of Finance. The Minister of Finance, Madam Chair Lady, mentioned that in the presentation that he had about a 58 million um, budgeted increase for 2024, if I understand correctly. And one of those, one of those items was um, the tourist tax of 9 million, which personally I don't agree with, That's, that it's realistic, but I'll move on. Turnover tax, 9 million. Payroll tax, 6 million. So the, the minister also mentioned that this is related to an increase in, in economic activities, so an increase in, 
and us making more money. But I just wanted to know um, if he can provide a little bit more information on what activity was additional that would be in alignment with maybe Tayat seeing an increase in a different in a different industry. Because across the board, I I know that a lot of people have been providing information. Uh, in terms of retailers on Front Street, in terms of their numbers being down. So I just wanted to really see what they base it on. Was it an anticipation, or was it really based on anything actual, considering we do have three months of 2024 already, and he did provide that information, but I need a link with the Ministry of Tayat. Like, if there's something new that happened that, that we didn't think of, it was just a little bit extra information. Uh, moving on to the Ministry of VSA, thank you very much for your answers. I would just like to know is in regards to the work permits, considering that there was this increase because of the expediting of the permits, the work permits, if there is any plan by the Ministry of VSA to increase the cost of actually getting a work permit. Um, moving on to ECYS, I covered that because that would be one of the, the questions that I have um, for the personnel movement. The only other one was in the answer from ECYS, they, they mentioned that the 12 million associated with or allocated to the construction of the Charlotte Brookson School um, is going to be done by government, not Charlotte Brookson, and that there's a plan for the expansion of John Lamarney Center, and that's where we can have a performing arts. But I just wanted to know exactly where in John Lamarney Center is it going to be expanded? Are we going to build up, or are we going to build out, or maybe go on the ring road? I just want to know because I still it still doesn't cover the need that we have that we have that we need a place for performing arts. Um, let us see, Taya, really quickly. I know some other MPs mentioned it. Um, it's about the marketplace again, right? Because initially, I believe Royal Caribbean said that they were going to pay for it, and now it's on the budget. So I just want to know, so is Royal Caribbean paying for it anymore? Do they have anything that they're paying, covering for that? And what happened to it exactly? Or is it the port? Or is it us? I just want to know the real breakdown, because it's changed a lot, too. And let us see. Ministry of General Affairs is the same question. Uh, regarding the personnel <coughs> movements, budget actual, and then comparison with function book. And I think I have covered all except the Ministry of Rami. Minister, thank you very much, because we were missing that last week, and I know that there's proper circumstances of why we did not have a presentation. But I take note of, I believe it was under accomplishments um, in the presentation from Rami, and four items were mentioned that popped out to me. It is release of new building code, joint island cleanup with the French side, finalizing underground cabling project, integrity training. And going to the release of the new building code, uh, I tried to uh, gather that information, whether we had it on file here or if it was released somewhere online. There's two different versions, so I would kindly like to ask through you, Madam Chair, if we could be provided with a copy of the new building code, and if that new building code actually covers um, what we want our island to look like, right? So building code, you would say that, okay, you have to build, construct with cement. I'm just wondering if the building code also covers containers because what you're seeing now on the island is an abundance of containers that are on the main roads. And quite frankly, the more we put containers that are mismatched and don't have any pretty exterior, we just look like a favela. We might as well just come, come from a favela somewhere, a shanty town, because then we don't have any charm. There's absolutely no charm to containers. Because in some countries in the Caribbean that everyone likes talking about how pretty it is, and they're always mentioned in the top five countries in the, in the islands, none of them allow actually containers to leave their port. So I just want to know in the release of new building code, if we have a new building code that includes containers being a place that we can build. Because when people come to invest in the island, I expect that they will invest into proper construction and not take in a 18-wheeler container and putting it on our road and calling it pretty and calling it a business. Um, joint island cleanup with the French side. If I can actually get some more information from the Ministry of Rami of what that entails or in what, what that has to do with, because I just wanted to see what the benefit, I mean, other than cleanliness, um, if I can get more information on the, the cost that was associated with it, because this one was a little bit uncertain for me. I really didn't hear that much about it. What are we going to do? Are we going to share garbage trucks? 
Are we going to clean up together beaches? I just needed to be really, really clear. Joint island cleanup with Friendside. I just want to know if there's rules associated with that because I, I would love that we were doing more things with the Friendside. Uh, finalizing underground cabling project. I just want to know if this is Rami or GB because I, I, I didn't know that government was, had their own network, but I think once I get that answer, then maybe it'll explain a lot, maybe with the grid market discussion too. So I just want to know if we have a different underground cabling project that is just strictly GB or government, or if government is also contributing towards GB putting uh, underground all of our um, electricity lines, the last remaining 10%, I think, that GB has. Also, integrity training. I, this one was really, really nice for me, too, to see on here as an accomplishment, because you know the really disturbing thing that happened in the last four months was people telling me about how annoyed they were about paying amounts to the Ministry of Rami, and I was like, what do you mean paying amounts? And they were like, oh, well, we actually allegedly had to transfer or pay people in the parking lot in Galley's Bay. So when you hear integrity training, I just really want to know like, if the integrity training is about what not to do. Because when people are calling names of persons that work within government, a government ministry, and you're hearing such crazy details, it's alleged, and I'm just like, well, it's coming from across the board. It's coming from engineers. It's coming from actual persons that have come up to me and said that they had been asked to pay. So the integrity training, is it going to curb this? Thanks a lot. <coughs> Madam Chair, like M MP Marlin, you are allowed an interruption. It's based on MP, Madam Chair, to you. Based on a comment made there by MP Deva, she's still not on. Go slower. Go closer. Just one moment there, MP Marlin. We'll get that fixed. <coughs> now it is. Yes. <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair, I'd like to interrupt the MP there. She made mention of Two questions. Well, one statement, and I'd like uh, to clarify. <clears throat> she says she's tired of hearing where persons in the community have to transfer payments to get building permits or pay in the parking lot on the friend side, Gallus Bay. You know, that song's a bit confusing. If someone have to pay for something, songs like a bribe, why would you transfer? to make it seem that you are doing something. You know, sometimes we get, say, hey, say. They say, and then they live a life of their own, you know, when we're trying to build a community. Oh, yeah, through you, Madam Chair. So thank you. Thank you, MP Marlin. MP De Weaver, you may continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I didn't realize I said transfer, but this is, what, this is what has happened, just so it's not hearsay. I've had persons come up to me and tell me that they're going crazy when they have to pay people in a parking lot in Galley's Bay. And this is not money that comes to the coffers of Rami, the same ministry that is actually increasing their air park uh, revenue generation that is coming in. So I want to know, the Ministry of Rami mentioned integrity training. My question was very clear. Does it include not taking bribes? That's what, it, that's what my question is, and I think hopefully I clarified it. When go, moving right along on to Rami, another person again, personal experience, coming up to me as a representative of the people and told me that they weren't aware that water rights were given to, to specific areas of water off of the bayside. So let's, let, me give it, let me explain it properly. So when I go swim in the water by DV, in the area where you have the underwater museum, they were told you cannot come there. So they said, and then they were like, how do you mean I can't swim there in this area? Because you have to pay $10. So I'm just wondering, for the Ministry of Rami, if they gave water rights to the underwater, the underwater museum, because the people who were swimming were told by someone on the boat, you cannot enter here unless you pay $10. So if that is the case, again, Rami, the same ministry that actually increased, I believe, $3 million is what the minister said, about $3 million in the air park. So they're doing a really good job of increasing the revenue because they're enforcing, right, what people have to pay for air park. 
I just want to know if there's new areas that they can get extra revenue on, which is now in the water. And if that's the case, that's what happened to, that's what happened this week. So I'm asking a question based on an actual experience. Now, let me see. I believe um, MP Gums was talking about constructions on Muller Bay with containers, and it goes back to my same question of the release of new building code. If when you're doing building code, if we're allowed to have, if this building code includes somewhere containers, because I couldn't find it based on the two different versions I found online. And the reason I bring it up again, right, salt water is corrosive, okay? Everyone that live on St. Martin knows that when you have metal by your house, especially if you're on the water side, Everything gonna rust. We have a big problem of rust. So if you're gonna bring containers on a bay side, I want to know what magic are you doing to make sure it don't rust, and then you actually going to be contributing more litter on the island when it starts eroding and you have corrosive metal. So uh, I just again, it's just reiterating what MP Gums is bringing up about Mullet Bay. Um, Brummy also mentioned in the answers actually that we got about enforcement. So if you have to bear with me because I need to go in here to see where actually it was talking about. But we asked about sewage. And Pigums also mentioned about the $17 million sewage plant. And what it said was, Brummy will continue the enforcement of the applicable laws. I, somewhere along that, I may have paraphrased my apologies. But I would like to know if they can tell me the last time that Vrami issued a fine for somebody letting their septic or their sewage out. That's, I, that's what I would like to know. Because they say enforcement of the applicable laws. Well, they will continue the enforcement of the applicable laws. And let us see. Um, I think that's actually it, Madam Chair. Once I have my graph with all my answers, Second round, we'll have everything come together in a nice picture. Thank you very much. Thank you, MP De Weaver. And I continue and I offer MP Mercelina the floor. MP Mercelina, you have the floor. Honorable President of Parliament, Secretary General, my honorable colleagues in Parliament, Prime Minister, the other ministers, their support staff, the people in the Tribune, and those following on whatever social media system, and in general, the people of St. Martin, good afternoon. Madam Chair, I realize every year again that the budget for country St. Martin, especially the approved budget for country St. Martin, is and remains the most important law for country St. Martin. But traditionally, how we are dealing with this budget will not, at the end of the day, contribute to a progress in evolution of the country that we want, we would like to see in the future. And that is the reason that I would like to make use of this opportunity to have a total different look towards the treatment of the budget in general, and especially the one of 2024. Madam Chair, we have to realize that this budget has been prepared by a outgoing government and I'm thankful for everything that they have done for the people of this country. And that the individual ministers of this current outgoing government have answered the questions by the new parliamentarians that have been recently sworn in. Since 10 and 10, St. Martin is a country within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. I want you guys to listen good what I have to say today for us to hold hands together to give progress to this country. About the position of the St. Martin within the kingdom, you will encounter different opinions. That being said, we are currently, I think currently, a pseudo-autonomous country and not a autonomous country. I repeat, a pseudo-autonomous country. 
that constitutionally forms part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands with its advantages and, and disadvantages. In the concept of autonomy, if the concept of autonomy is executed correctly into practice within the kingdom, it brings with it responsibilities and obligations from the side of St. Martin, but also from the side of the Netherlands. A kingdom relationship with, will only flourish if the relationship is based on love, respect, goodwill, understanding, and honest intention to help each other with a fundamental commitment of obligation towards each other. Like it's going now by assisting in managing a prison, assisting in constructing a new detention center, technical police assistance with a RST organization, a Marie Jose, should not be the only accent of attention in a love relationship between two countries. We function autonomously, autonomously in actually two areas. We have our own parliament and we have our government. And what we should have is our own budget that is controlled by ourselves and not controlled by the CFT. We can speak about autonomy if we have an independent parliament, an independent government, and also a budget not controlled by the CFT. And of course, not a budget, like every year again, that is handicapped by extreme interest rates to be paid back by a country of which its people are living under dear circumstances and extreme poverty. It is precisely those things that are not yet in order in our country that we will not be able to overwin if the kingdom, kingdom government does not work together with us. The national budget that we traditionally fight with every year does not give me the space that I would need to work on the concept of nation building. We have to understand that very good, that the way we are shifting with money from one department to the other, from ministry to the other, giving ourselves the illusion that we are working on progress of this country is not going to happen if we do not think bigger outside the box with this budget. I need a national budget with a surplus to work on the concept of nation building. If we do not have a surplus in our budget, my grandchildren will be still paying interest on Dutch loans without ever having a national library, a national university, and a national sport complex. If we settle for these types of national budgets year in, year out, we will never get a decent traffic infrastructure in this country. We will never be able to have our national library. We will never be able to have a national university, a national police academy, a acceptable, sustainable healthcare system, a reliable utility company, a reliable, sustainable telecommunication, and a great social welfare system for our people. I am today requesting the Dutch government to really commit to develop, to develop and contribute to actually a prosperous St. Martin. By entertaining this type of traditional national budgets that we have, we are going to remain victim of our own destiny. Actually, the reparation that seems to be a sensitive topic that each Caribbean country is talking about nowadays is nothing more than a cry for understanding and assistance for the realization of the concept of nation building. I repeat, the reparation that Caribbean islands are crying about is for understanding and assistance for the realization 
of future nation building for their country. Furthermore, I would like to address two areas that we need to work on together, namely the timing of this budget and the dependence, the dependency on the Netherlands after Hurricane Irma, Maria, and the COVID pandemic. The first issue being the timing of consideration of our budget. In the Constitution, Article 100, Paragraph 3, it is stipulated that the budget of country St. Martin must be presented to Parliament before September 1st, preceding the next fiscal year. In my opinion, that sounds extremely logical. After all, every company, every organization, and also every country want to know what the budget is before we start a new year. I have therefore my, been surprised in past years, and I'm surprised again now that the budget has not been set prior to the new year. You can ask yourself why we cannot manage to adopt the budget earlier. Apparently, the internal processes within the civil service and administration are not sufficiently in order to finalize a budget within an orderly process of handling. If we as a country of St. Martin pretend to stand on our own feet, that implies that we will need a solid foundation as a country, and that foundation also includes the discipline to adopt a budget prior to a subsequent budget year. MP Marlin, you have the opportunity to interrupt at this time. Um, Madam Chair, a point of interruption again. Um, <clears throat> I heard my colleague MP said, that he's rather surprised again that this budget didn't finish on time. But when I listened to the minister said that the budget was ready since March 2023. That was last year, not this year. And it had to do with minor changes because of the Enya saga. So to say now that the minister haven't done that. It's quite confusing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Marlin. MP Marcelina, you may continue. After the new government is sworn in, I will draw the attention of the new Minister of Finance to this matter of delay for us to try to present to Parliament on time a budget for the upcoming year. The second issue I want to touch base on is our depressing dependency on the Netherlands after Hurricane Irma, Maria, and the COVID pandemic that is actually disturbing a dynamic evolution, as I said, of our country. A loan expires in 2024, and that loan has to be refinanced. That is not a small loan, but quite a large amount of no less than 316 million. And correctly, the minister said that we got that fixed for 3.4%. But actually, if you make that calculation on a year base, that is a lot of money for a small, vulnerable country as country St. Martin. And although, in my opinion, there is a certain gratitude to, for the help from the Netherlands, it is important that we, as an autonomous country within the kingdom, become less dependent on others and thus less dependent on the Netherlands. In my view, two things should happen. On one hand, the new government of St. Martin should enter into an open discussion with the Dutch government where we discuss our restricting financial position and the debt problems of St. Martin in more details. More details. On the other hand, I remain state stating that we as a country must assume our responsibility to become more resilient and thus less dependent on others. Disasters occur from time to time hurricane, COVID, you name it. In my view, it is important to be prepared for them. 
Precisely at the time when we are doing well, we therefore have to start building up extra financial reserves so that if such a disaster occurs, we will be able to support and build our country independently and provide the population with the primordial necessities. If we claim to be an autonomous country within the kingdom, it also means that we must start taking measures for ourselves to be less dependent on others. <coughs> to turn now to the substance of the 2024 budget, the outgoing government has presented a budget, and that budget is composed by a large number of established financial items, both in revenues and expenditures. Given the timing of consideration of the budget, we as a new parliament, parliament really have no choice but to adopt this budget. There are a number of financial risks involved, and I want to name them now before the, before the term of the new government, so that the parliament and the people of St. Martin understand what the outgoing government has handed over to the new government. The first financial risk is the increasing cost of 70 million compared to 2023. These higher costs are caused are cost in part by the higher interest cost due to the refinancing of loans that the Netherlands provided to us in the time of the hurricane and in the time of the COVID. Another part of the higher cost lies in personnel costs, especially the higher cost resulting from the recalibration of the Ministry of Justice with the development of the Funci book. It is my belief that this process could have been completed much earlier by the previous administration, avoiding unnecessary problems with officials at the Ministry and in the justice chain. In addition, the cost of this exercise and its coverage should also have taken place in earlier budgets and not in the present budget prepared by a caretaker government. The second financial risk of this budget concerns the coverage of those 70 million additional costs. The coverage consists of a forecast of higher tax revenues, in part so is my expectation those higher revenues will materialize. After all, our economy is fortunately back in recovery, and so is also my expectation that government revenues will increase. However, we must also be realistic, and I wonder if the current caretaker government has been realistic in calculating revenues and whether these have not been overestimated. If this estimation has been set too high, the incoming government faces a considerable task to still find coverage for the financial gap that would then arise. This also applies to the visitors' entry tax, which is calculated to contribute 20 million, and as we have heard this morning, it's just by the SER at this particular moment. It's not even approved in Parliament. And I do not know how we're going to talk about the 20 million revenue while this is by the SER. A third risk I see is with the social funds as managed by the asset fame. There have been deficits in the health funds for years. And those deficits are covered by a deposit from the AOV fund and the AVBZ fund. As a result, the AOV fund will eventually no longer have sufficient money to guarantee the AOV payment for future generation pensioners. The previous government did not include adequate measures there, which means that the coming government will face a difficult decision to make to see where he's going to get funds to accomplish the payment for the future pensioners for country St. Martin. The fourth risk of this budget lies with the public companies, especially the GEBE, Telem, and Post NV. In recent years, the newspaper and the internet have been full of 
the problems that occurred at the GEBE following, for example, the cyber attack. Finally, I conclude that the previous administration failed to adequately supervise management and hold them accountable for what has been going on at our utility company, GEBE. In short, things went wrong on all fronts. And actually, they were not a good organization to guard ourselves against the cyber attacks in GEBE. Further, we have to consider the threat of the financial status of Telem at this particular moment, and also the post NV. We have to realize that the new government that is going to take over the management of this country will encounter severe problems with this Telem and post NV. I see further, once more, Financial risks with this budget for the new upcoming administration. Risk one is the substantial increase in costs, which I believe should have been accounted for in earlier budget, especially if we talk about financing of the Funksy book for those at the Ministry of Justice. The second risk is the substantial increase in the revenues of which it is questionable whether they are realistically budgeted. Risk three, out of control healthcare expenses and their coverage still by the AOV and the AVBZ fund. And risk four, the financial problems in a number of public companies, especially the GEBE and TELEM. It is a very challenging time that we are going through with our country. I understand all what the the missionary government at this particular moment has done for the country, but still I think realizing that soon a new government will take over the management of this country, I think it's good for us to state these items for us to realize that there are high risks with the budget that we have no choice then to approve for country St. Martin. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, MP Mercelina. I continue according to the speaker's list and invite MP Marlin to take the floor. MP Marlin, you have the floor. Um, Madam Chair, uh, thank you to my colleague MPs. Good afternoon to the Council of Ministers, I say. Good afternoon to the members in the audience, the media, and those listening at home or viewing on the World Wide Web. I say thank you for tuning in on this budget debate. Um, Madam Chair, I had a few questions that I would want to ask the ministers. But after listening and listening carefully to the MPs speaking before me, especially the MP that spoke directly before me, he painted a bloom, a dark, dark picture of this budget. He called it basically a budget of risk. Madam Chair, I'm a bit confused because in one sentence, it is said we can't approve this budget. Then in the other sentence, it is we must approve this budget. So, Madam Chair, I'm kind of confused when I hear the good MP talk about it being a budget, a budget of risk. MP Mercelina, you have the opportunity to interrupt. The MP that has now the floor is so impressed with what I have presented to Parliament and to the Council of Ministers that I think that he did not understand good what I said, but at no moment did I said that I will not or if I will approve this budget. In no moment I said it, just for clarity's sake. Thank you, MP Marcelina. You may continue, MP Marlin. But what I do 
what I definitely heard, Madam Chair, is that um, the previous administration, seeing that the colleague MP, my colleague MP is talking now about the previous administration, my question then is, which administration? Because from what I can see, the administration is still here. Reason why they presented this budget. Then I hear about the outgoing administration and the incoming administration and the administration that coming in, which budget they will walk from. So they have me a little confused. Um, another thing that have me very, very, very confused is that um, while I see in the presentation of this budget some great stuff, great stuff for the civil servants of this country, for the justice workers of this country, for the building of a new prison in this country. I hear oftentimes from my colleague MPs the word halt. Madam Chair, I took the time out to do like my colleague MP and Google the word halt. And when I Google the word halt, it refers to stop or pause. And when I put it in context of what I hear during the budget debate, and also during to our previous central committee meetings where we had a very nice presentation, the word halt keep coming up. And it's scary. It's scary to say the least, Madam Chair, that when the Prime Minister was asked what, would she, what she would like to see the next administration do, she said, continue the progress. Now, continuing the progress in HALT can't go hand in hand. How can we tell the justice workers that have been waiting 13 years, 13 years to realize the function book. And I see every week some 25 persons in a newspaper flashing, glad that their LB have been signed. Something that I heard was a mere political stunt prior to the election. But I'm glad to see that the Honorable Minister of Justice was able to finalize, finalize the function book, where every week I see 25 members showing off their LB that the function book have been realized. And I think even today, while we're here in Parliament, another batch probably is on its way to the Minister of Finance or to the Finance Department to complete another 25. But then when you hear the word halt, is it the next administration, the two by four administration, or the two by five administration, or in my terms, it looked like the never going sit administration, because the process of getting them sit seems to be halted. But I won't go into that. So my question, my question, Will the next administration halt the progress that I've seen in this budget? Madam Chair, I would like to show you again to talk about the 2% cost of living adjustment that haven't been realized probably for the last 10 years, 9 years, 10 years, 11 years, a lot of years, like my MP. Emmanuel say, a lot of years. I just hear someone say, 12 years. So those people, those civil servants, are anxiously waiting to get their cost of living adjustment of 2% and 1% on the vacation allowance pay out to them when we approve this budget that is referred to as a risk budget. When this budget is approved, those civil servants will get their payment retroactive. Because in the Central Committee meeting, I didn't ask much questions, but I asked, what will 
B, the effect if this budget don't pass, where it pertains to the 2% cost of living adjustment. And I was glad when I received the answers to hear that it will be paid retroactive. So Madam Chair, again, I must say in this budget, I see some good things. Madam Chair, for those in the prison, Madam Chair, and we do know we have some people in the prison, we all know. For those people in the prison, Madam Chair, for them to hear the word halt on the development of a new prison. You know where some 30 million or more guilders was made available to build a new prison. After 30 years, we haven't built, construct a new prison on the island. So to hear the word halt, to halt the progress on the new prison is very disturbing to hear. Um, Madam Chair, again, the word halt, you know, when we talk about progress in a country, and I see in this budget where some over three million guilders, three million guilders was collected in 2023, more than was budgeted for building permits. And then to hear when the new administration comes in, they plan on halting the progress when it comes to construction. So Madam Chair, through you, I had to make those statements because it worried me to hear when we talk about a country moving forward and progress and continuity, I would hear that the incoming government, whenever they come in, the first order of the day will be to halt. Like I say, when I Googled the word halt, it said stop and to pause. And to stop and to pause progress could never, ever, ever be good. So Madam Chair, I would like to ask a couple questions, just a few questions to the Minister of, Just, the Minister of Justice. You know, during your presentation on the new prison, which we hope we get very soon, the presentation with UNOPS during the Central, it was a bit, a little bit vague. So I'd like to ask you, through you, Madam Chair, to the Minister of Justice, what are the new amenities? Can you provide a list of the new amenities that will come with this new pr prison compared to the amenities that is there now? So if you can put a list of the amenities that we have now and what will be the new amenities. That's the only question I have for you, Minister of Justice. To the Minister of Education, first of all, I'd like to Congratulate the Olympic Committee on holding a fair and transparent election where a new, a new Olympic Committee president was elected, someone who is no stranger to sports on the island. Congratulations in order to Naomi Constancia. Now my question to you, the Minister of Education, to you, Madam Chair, is, what about the subsidy to the Olympic Committee? Can you elaborate a little bit on the subsidy? In closing, Madam Chair, I would like to use a sentence, couple words that I heard in my first day in Parliament. It was from my colleague MP who said, show up show up, just show up. Madam Chair, those words stayed with me. And I would like to implore on my colleague MPs in this room who have to vote for this budget, not a risk budget, but a budget for the people of St. Martin, not for the 406 persons that voted for my person, or for the 14,443 that voted overall. But for the entire population of St. Martin, let us show up. Let us vote, let us approve this year's budget. 
because this is a good budget, especially when I read the 2% cost of living adjustment for the hardworking civil servants that work tirelessly. Maybe they didn't have it on time, but at this budget, on this budget, so although they were given a letter right after election to seize all work, put down your pen, stop working, stop hiring, stop doing everything, they still continue. They work hard, whether you were dimensionnaire, whether you were outgoing, whether you're soon to be gone, but one thing you do, you still live up to the obligations of the people of St. Martin. And you presented not only a budget, but a good budget. Not a budget of risk, but a good budget. In closing, the best remark I hear so far is that the next administration will present the budget before the budget deadline. So, this month, September, whenever the next budget deadline for 2025, it's going to be on time. But guess what? The same civil servants that work on this one is what you all gonna need work on that one. So when you think you're throwing, they're under the bus, you're throwing the civil servants who work on making this budget and all the nice screens we see on the TV, the nice presentations, the slideshows, not them, they're politicians, the civil servants. So to the civil servants, I say thank you. This is my first year in parliament, and I see the work that you've done in preparing this budget. And I look forward for the next budget. That will have to be prepared on time. But then I ask myself, when will the next council of ministers sit? Because like I mentioned, I hear they have till March 4th, then they get till March 29th, and then, then I hear they're gonna get another extension, then another extension. The process seems like it's been halted in forming a next government. So I say, hurry up, come, because I would like to debate that budget I hear about. I just hear the next budget going to be a realistic one, not a budget of risk. It's going to be finally the best budget. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be right here in Parliament. We're going to debate that too. Madam Chair, I thank you. Thank you, MP Marlin. We continue, and I offer the floor to MP La Cruz. A blessed afternoon, Madam Chair Lady. A blessed afternoon, Madam Chair Lady, Council of Ministers, my colleagues, and those in the Tribune watching. The population following video, all the social media, and on our YouTube channel. Madam Chair Lady, I am somewhat happy that I chose to speak after MP Marlin, because it's extremely important that the new government understands something that we have experienced. Me, myself, being in the background of most of the ministers, of three or four ministers already, and helping with all kinds of stuff, putting and answering questions, putting plans together, and trying to execute while others just sit and talk. Madam Chair Lady, I want to commend the Council of Ministers for a budget properly put together and the civil servants who actually helped. 
And I'd like to tell them this. I asked during the previous meeting two questions. The first question was, what would you like to see the new government continue with that you have started? Some of the ministers took proper, proper, proper advantage of that question and laid it down for all to hear. And I implore St. Martin to please pay attention to what this previous government, or the government that is outgoing, was busy with all this time, and what we expect the new government to do when they go in. Madam Chair Lady, I have two questions for the Minister of Rami. One is, if there are any plans for a sidewalk in the Simpson Bay area. And the other question is if there's any plan to control the release of septic water from businesses in the Simpson Bay area. As I have seen it myself, floating feces all over the lagoon. I have one question for the minister of General Affairs. Some time back, the Ministry of TIAT and the Cabinet, we worked on a request from the Hrui Funds for 7.5 million for agriculture that would actually help our farmers with hydroponics, reforestation, local livestock and poultry, and some backyard farming pilot projects. Have we heard anything back from them as yet, as this would be a project that would actually help St. Martin in great? To the Minister of Justice, I said it the last time, your presentation, your clarity, your dedication to what you have done for the country, goes beyond, and I thank you. For the new Minister of Justice, whoever that may be, I would like to see plans, not only to fix the prison, but to make sure that our kids don't end up in prison. The rehabilitation of our people that are in there and when they come out. I met a friend that spent some time locked up and he said, bro, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I've been in there so long I can't figure things out. Because he was thrown in a hole and almost or no plan on when he came back out, how he would pick up, be able to pick up his life. So the new Minister of Justice, that is a task that I will try to hold you to. The, the other question I asked was concerning how much we have lost in court cases. Madam Chair, I've realized being in the executive branch that every time the bucket is kicked down the road, that was not my problem. I didn't create it. I don't know where it came from. Let someone else deal with it. The reason why I asked for those numbers was to make sure that we open a path for a motion that I will bring in the second round, where we keep talking about saving monies and spending monies 
but we need to reach a point where we start to do this wisely because it makes absolutely no sense with the court cases that we've been losing over and over. Madam Chair Lady, I will sound like John the Baptist in the wilderness when I say these letters again. L N G. Madam Chair Lady, this year the FCCA will be held on St. Martin. And everyone that I've been to and every conference that I've heard, this was the topic. Madam Chair Lady, I think it would be an embarrassment to the country if we don't have a plan that could accommodate or move forward with this low cost to be able to refuel, but also plug in our cruise ships when they come to our shores on St. Martin. Madam Chair Lady, I remember the first time I heard about this, the minister and myself jumped on it and started moving quick because we also heard that companies were in touch with neighboring islands like St. Kitts and they will end up tapping into our market. The question is, Madam Chair Lady, why do we always have to be the ones to lag behind? Why can we not go back to the days when we were the first ones to do something in the Caribbean? And it's because it didn't come from me, it came in from he. So I'm pushing it, I'm doing it, or I have a better plan. That needs to end, Madam Chair Lady. So look out for that motion also. Madam Chair Lady, I asked the Minister of Finance for the amount of number plates that were left behind every year. And let me explain something, Madam Chair Lady. One of the first requests that I saw when I went into the cabinet of the Minister of Tiat was a car rental requesting an expansion. The car rental had, I think it was 25 cars, and they wanted 24, 25 more cars to be able to continue growing. And the reply was automatically denied because there's a monitorium. But hold and behold, a day or two after, I saw new cars that were giving, being given our plates because there were no other plates to give out. So I started to ask the question, how could that be possible? And we realized real quickly after asking for some data that there were, if I'm not mistaken, over 1,000 R plates or 1,200 R plates that were not picked up every year because car rentals that had a car rental for license for 50 cars only picked up 10 cars every year. So the car rentals that existed could not expand and what did they do? They would go on the front side and get French number plates and continue expanding their fleets with French cars. So we lost money because we printed the plates. We lost income because we didn't open up. 
and we are forcing the businesses to do what I would consider in many an illegal activity. So when the minister came in, we sat, we discussed, and we opened up a plan on how to clean up the public transport on the island. And from many we heard, La Cruz leave that alone. La Cruz leave that alone. Madam Chair, lady, I have never been the type to leave nothing alone. I saw many times in Parliament questions being asked. So I am now here on the same platform to answer your questions. And I will take every opportunity to do so. Madam Chair Lady, I've heard people mention of bus and taxi licenses being sold. And my answer to that has always been one and very, very easy one. Please find one and go straight to the prosecutor's office and file a complaint if you have ever paid for anything, be it bus, taxi, building permit, whatever it is. Advise the people properly so they could do the right thing. The blame and games need to stop. Madam Chair Lady, today we have an X amount of drivers that no longer have to pay someone else for a permit while not making that money themselves. The rental of a permit is a illegal act. Permits were not to be rented out to anyone. So all those that were doing that, you are wrong. So you could get upset now because that income that you had, you no longer have. Then I turned to the Minister of Finance and asked him, did they pay taxes on it? Because it, it, is, it is illegal, and it is income from an illegal act. Madam Chair Lady, I am tired of hearing he from here, he from here, foreigner this, foreigner that. I am exhausted. As if I ask anyone in here, where were you born? Where were your parents born? Your grandparents born? Your great grandparents born? We will find that none of us could stand after all those questions. MP Otley. <laughs> Except MP Otley. So, Madam Chair Lady, if you want, and this is something that I've repeated many times, if you want people to care about St. Martin, that when they build their home, they don't let their septic run on the streets, that when they throw away their garbage, they throw it in the bins, that they don't drive around and throw garbage outside, you cannot make me feel like a second-class citizen in a country where I have decided to call home. Madam Chair Lady, the thought irritates me. It frustrates me. And for many years in the school, I saw Independence Day of Jamaica, Independence Day of the Dominican Republic, Independence Day of Jamaica being celebrated 
greater by kids born here on St. Martin because they have never felt as if St. Martin was their home. Madam Chair Lady, to those that didn't know, I am going to say it so they know. I was not born on St. Martin. I was born in the Dominican Republic to a Dominican mother. But away, if you ever wonder where my heart is, ever. Madam Chair Lady, this outgoing government did miracles. Madam Chair Lady, we came back from a hurricane and went through COVID. And I've not heard of one person that died in their home alone or hungry during this period. While in bigger countries, this took place. Madam Chair Lady, we need to reach the place where we start looking at what has been done on St. Martin, commend it, and give feedback, positive feedback, and not always political. Not always, it, it, people are getting sick and tired of the political games that are being played. Madam Chair Lady, I did not come to Parliament to play games. As many have noticed, I am in every meeting. Be it have quorum, no quorum, I am here because I have been paid to do a job. So I am going to do the job. If you have emotion, and it is a good motion, it is a good law that I think will help our people, I will vote for it. And I expect the same from you, each and every one of you, to do exactly the same. Because the people of those days voting blindly for who they know and who their family vote for, those days are over. You now need to work for your votes. Madam Chair Lady, if it's one thing that I made sure I did while being in the ministry, I worked day and night. Long hours. And I made sure to do that in an honorable manner. So when others think it was cool to call my name. Madam Chair Lady, I am here. I am here. And according to 312 people, I am here to stay. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP La Cruz. And as I continue with the speakers in this meeting of the handling of the draft 2024 budget, I offer the floor to MP Otley. MP Otley, you have the floor. They set me up. I'm coming up. I don't go to a next. Um, let me use MP La Cruz. Cruz. Oh. Okay. 
Perfect. Thank you, Madam Chair. Once again, good day to everyone in the Tribune. See, we have some more guests, the Honorable Prime Minister, and now I address you on this side as a member of Parliament. Through you, Madam Chair, this is a very strange budget. I have to say that I'm here submitting a budget on the government's behalf while I'm in opposition. It's a very strange budget, well, to me. Some things are not adding up, Madam Chair. Allow me to elaborate. While in a perfect world, two by four, two times four gives you eight. But for some reason in this parliament, in this room, the math's not matting. <laughs> Something is a bit wrong. Allow me, to, allow me to elaborate. I have noticed, Madam Chair, through you, there's a this side and there's a that side. I hear this side speak about preclearance. As a matter of fact, I've heard this side in a radio interview say, in order to save St. Martin, we need preclearance. But we come in Parliament, and then I hear that side say, no for preclearance. Madam Chair, I hear this side support Saha, GHI, Artly Care, whatever it may be called, universal health care. Meanwhile, I've heard that side openly campaign against a universal health insurance. See, Madam Chair, in 2020, 2019, I had a slogan, only we can save we. And I stood by this, Madam Chair, and in, as a member of parliament, I brought a, a, a motion for us to establish our own procurement measure, whereby we don't have to fall victim to the World Banks and the NRPBs, because in their laws, it states that they will not supersede the laws of the land. But however, we do not have a procurement measure, so we have to adapt that of the World Bank. So hence the reason for what we would call unfair bidding measures. I wouldn't say it's unfair, but we find so. We don't find that there's a lot of local involvement in these projects, but it's because we have not had the ability to save we. As a minister, we turned around and I did the SOS policy, whereby investors have to invest in our country. We did the scholarship program, helping our, our, our future. We did the health levy. Yes, it's at the sale. But we are taking the initiative. We are taking the initiative where we can be more resilient and save ourselves. As a minister, I sent an instruction to the airport for the $1 safety fee to be immediately implemented. They instructed, they advised that there are financial constraints and asked for more time. But I told them that it is a matter of urgency because this $1 safety fee can help us save we. But on the other hand, Madam Chair, while I am outgoing, I hear the incoming speak. And it seems that they don't believe that only we can save we, but they believe that it takes the Netherlands to save we. When I hear that and I hear this side scream, no to UNAPS, no to the Netherlands. As a matter of fact, I hear the other side scream, no to the Netherlands so much that when we had to take <coughs> conditions in order to pay salaries, the other side said, let's find a way. You see, Madam Chair, this budget represents police payment. Not only police payment, it, may, it represents justice payment. It represents a new prison. It represents us finally having the wastewater management project. It represents the mental health facility that has been a proven sign. And it represents probably for the first time an agriculture finance, finance towards agriculture. Nothing will be perfect. And I hear my colleague MP say it. He said, when you're in opposition, everything is a no, no, no. And when you're in government, it don't look so bad. <laughs> well, I can tell you, MP, sometimes I just make it look good. Because being over there ain't all what you think it is. Because no matter what you do, you will not please everyone. No matter what you do, there will be no such thing as perfection. So if you have in your head that you are coming to save the day, I urge you, incoming government, think again. No matter what, there will be naysayers. 
I like to say to myself as well and my colleagues across the room, I am proud of how far we have come. I am proud that we can sit here today and discuss a balanced budget. I am proud to know that we have overcame or overcome the worst pandemic in the history known to man. And being here 16 square miles where they have major, major countries that are shutting down right now. As we speak, we can sit here, no mask, and dialogue together. I even commend each other for the way that we handle elections. Because in some countries, elections cause for violence. So we are example, not only to ourselves, but maybe to the bigger countries. So I say, like my fellow MP, I too eagerly await this perfect budget, this perfect 2025 budget that is to come. And a lot of people have been asking me, what happened? We ain't seen you in the newspaper. You stop working, you stop pushing because election done. And no, I've been instructed to halt. <laughs> I've been instructed to stop what I'm doing, cease. So I'm halting. <laughs> but I asked for permission to unhalt. <laughs> because Because I've been waiting, and I've... MP Otley, you may continue. Okay. <laughs> and I have packed my office, unpacked my office, and packed my office again. So... Members, please allow the MP to make his presentation without interruptions. Thank you. Thank MP you. Otley, you may Thank continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, without further ado, Madam Chair, I would just like to stress the importance. But on another note, I have realized that there is an evolution in Parliament because the questions that I have received from the members of Parliament, I can say are actually good questions. I can speak for myself and I'm sure I have not heard any grandstanding redundant questions. So if I can throw a jab, I can also give a compliment and say that the standard of Parliament seems to be raising it seems to be raising, and I hope that we keep it on this level and keep it on a rise. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was my statements. I don't have any questions. Thank you, MP Otley. We continue, and I ask MP Irian to take the floor. MP Irian, you have the floor. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening, Khrifi. Good evening to my fellow MPs. Good evening to the Honorable Ministers, Council of Ministers. Um, good evening to the viewing public. Madam Chair, first I'd like to uh, again thank the Ministry of Finance and the Minister of Finance for the hard work that they continue to put in the budget and their consistent, significant improvements that they have done over the last four years. I'm sure this budget, 2024, is probably one of the most significant budgets over the last four years. This is the first budget that will significantly impact uh, civil servants. The first time we're having a COLA increase. Now, over the last decade, we've had discussions regarding salaries of civil servants, um, the justice workers, and this is the first budget that's, that will actually impact that. The 2% the vacation pay that was not even ever discussed in the past will be approved in this budget at 1%. It's also budgeted again in a multi-annual budget for next year, which goes up to 8%. So again, we also address the justice workers, their backlogs, but also their functional pay. So again, as I mentioned, this budget is one of the most important budgets in the last decade. Madam Chair, I, I heard from one of the speakers earlier that mentioned the, the budget and mentioned that this budget does not reflect, in his opinion, the contribution to the building of, of, of this nation, does not contribute to a nation building. 
Madam Chair, the whole speech, in my opinion, sounded like a campaign speech, Madam Chair. But I'd like to remind the MP that elections is over and that we are here now in Parliament. And if the budget does not reflect what he wants, but MP wants, Madam Chair, should you, Madam Chair, that the MP has the opportunity to still make amendments. Make amendments to the budget where it will reflect this nation building that he would like to see. So I look forward to the amendments coming from the MP, Madam Chair, in the first round or second round. So we, the MPs, can see the vision that the MP has for nation building in this country. The opportunity is there. And I will support any amendments in this regard that shows proper nation building in the budget 2024, Madam Chair. I also look forward, Madam Chair, to, as the MP mentioned, the on-time budget of 2025 um, for September. Without the delays that we've had, we've had, there won't be elections, there won't be a pandemic, there won't be all these so-called excuses of the past. So I'll also look forward to that 2025 budget, Madam Chair. The MP also mentioned that it's depressing the dependence that this government has put on the Netherlands. But at the same time, the MP basically stated the plans for us to go, for the incoming government to go to the Netherlands to basically beg for the financing to be able to balance the budget. I'm sure very, very, very contradicting, contradicting words. It was also stated that in this budget, there's very high interest rates and there's concerns about the interest rates in the budget. I've indicated countless times, Madam Chair, in all of our presentations, that we have had the lowest interest rates within the, the kingdom when it comes to all of our refinancing loans. So I look forward again to potential new interest rates that the incoming government will be able to re renegotiate. And this will be reminded of these MPs in the following budget. So I'm looking forward to, we have, it's in October is the next, um, the next loan payment. So I look forward for the new refinancing terms to come in before that, which we could save in terms of interest to go towards the necessary payments that we have. It was also stated that we will, that we need to go to the Netherlands and be able to have conversations and let them know about our precarious situation on St. Martin and explain to them our dire situation. Madam Chair, I'm happy to see, well, he was here earlier on, the former prime minister, also chair of, this, of the steering committee, who could attest that this government, and I will even say through the Ministry of Finance, maybe even more so, has built the strongest relationship with the Netherlands over the last probably decade. So when it comes to discussions, we have done that. But getting the job done requires more than talk, Madam Chair. It requires action. When we say we're going to do something, we've done it. And that's why we've gotten what we've gotten today. That's why we've gotten the best interest rates. That's why we've gotten capital expenditure. That's why we've gotten the, the interest rates. That's why we've gotten the agreement for the ENIA, among others. It wasn't because we went there to beg with the Netherlands, because we went on not just discussions, but when we say A, we do A. When we say B, we do B. We've completed every single action that we've said we're going to do, and that was required of us. Regarding the Vrami accusations, I, I agree with MP De Weaver, and for sure, um, I take, or we take integrity serious, so I would definitely ask that the individuals that almost are now co-conspirators, um, the bribe for whatever it was in Avrami to please come forward and report it. Um, it we could sit on the floor of parliament, but let them come forward, send an email, let us hold the department heads accountable, let, hold, let us hold uh, civil servants accountable, employees accountable, to these actions, it, it makes little difference for us to sit in Parliament and we don't come and report it. So if this, if this is a matter, like MP Lacruz mentioned, let's go, let's report it, let's go to the prosecutor. In the past, this has happened once or twice in the past. I remember when I first was a, a, a controller in TIAT, we had a case like this. They came forward and they were reporting, the persons were let go and they were, they were fined and um, we dealt with it. So. Um, I'd rather not have accusations. I'd rather these individuals come forward 
and we can, we can find a, a very safe and, and secure way for them to do it, and let's hold the individuals accountable that, that breach our integrity in government. MP Otley mentioned the, the strange atmosphere of the budget, which I, which I would agree, because we sat down as ministers and presented, and then we were asked mainly by the incoming government what are our plans for the future, what are our plans for 2024. And I sat there and I asked myself, I guess they know something more than I know, because I thought they were coming in. So the lines of questioning for me, Madam Chair, was very, I wouldn't say concerning, um, but I, I have to say concerning the fact that you know, we have a deadline coming up, I guess two days from now, we have no idea if we are sitting in or we're sitting out. As MP Atley mentioned, I've packed up most of my stuff. Um, I haven't halted though, because we, ha we, we still have to pay salaries, and um, we have commitments. Madam Chair, obviously I will be supporting this, this budget that we have presented. As I mentioned, this is probably one of the most important budgets of the last few years. Um, this budget ensures that we pay the 2%, we pay the vacation pay, we pay the justice workers. And we have, I don't see honestly um, anything else much more that we could have done better. We are, make, we are consistently making imp improvements. What we can do is continue to hold entities accountable, continue to make sure that we enforce the laws to continue to raise our revenues. We cannot continue to execute. We have, I see a lot of MPs asking for a lot of different things within their um, future motions or things they would like to see. And for me, those are also wish lists. I haven't heard any MP, especially from the income of government, mention anything about how are we going to generate more revenues. We can't continue to squeeze blood out of the rocks that we have. So I look forward, as I mentioned before, to the amendments that are coming that will build this nation, and I definitely will be supporting any of those if necessary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Irian. And I now give the floor to MP Silveria Jacobs. MP Jacobs, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. I know for some of the viewers it must be a little confusing, but yes, the elections were in January. We swore in as members of parliament on February 10th. And as I've explained in press briefing as Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, we have the opportunity to serve on both sides for three months. And luckily, because we are able to hold on to the government and ensure that the people's business continue to be handled. Madam Chair Lady, initially I wasn't going to say much because I just wanted to ensure I have a place to say something in the second round you know, just make a few statements. But with your permission, Madam Chair, I'd like to at least address one or two things. Even though my colleagues, minister MPs, have already done a valiant job of it, including some other MPs that I've heard. This budget, Madam Chair Lady, is a law. As such, it requires the whole trajectory of a law. Yes, it's faster than the others, but it still requires a whole lot of work. And definitely when MPs saw what was printed out, then they get an idea of the vast amount of work and back checking and back checking and how we could come to have a problem with which version came from which version didn't reach. At the end of the day, it is the civil servants and on their backs that we stand to be able to represent the people of St. Martin at every turn and especially in defending laws. So, when I hear statements about the risk, I think even our personal budgets have risk, Madam Chair. Everybody sets a budget based on your income, some have a job, some have a business, which they know they're gonna collect X amount per month to be able to meet their expenditures. And everyone would want to hope that they can do that, that you earn more than you're spending, that you're able to save and put away for your rainy day. 
But the reality is, Madam Chair, when we came into government in 2019-20, we were still in recovery from a disaster. And I want to thank my colleague who said, we have come a long way. A lot of people forget where we were in 2020. And we forget the cry that was made for stability, stability, stability. And why was that needed? So that legislation, so that structure could come into the change that everyone wanted. Because as I've said before, the NDV isn't a Silveria NDV, so you all don't have to reject it because Silveria have to leave the executive branch of government. Our contraire, when I left Parliament to go into government back in 2019, it was brought forward from the Ministry of General Affairs, the Bach Department, which had started under the leadership, I believe, in 2010-12, 2010-14, was Prime Minister Sarah Westcott-Williams. And the fact that all through those years, with the help of the UNDP, here I say not UNDP, United Nations, that assist countries in their development. The same United Nations that we laud me and Motley for, but when your prime minister go, we have to hear stories. The same representation. But because we're not fully independent, we don't think that the trip is worth our while. But I will outline some of the things that we have gained as a country from those very trips. But well, let me go back. UNDP, 2012, I believe, or 11, started this process with the government of St. Martin, with the aim to get to a development plan. But why was that never realized? Government come, government go. Government come, government go. So with stability, we were able to revamp the vision, include government programs from 2010 to 2020, and therefore, there is Everybody's included. Everybody who's here now is a byproduct of whoever was there from 2010 to now. Let's just be honest. Somebody remarked to me the other day, but your current members of parliament, half of which maybe he run with the party they run with before, but if you look good, you're still seeing any up DP at the end of the day or some derivative thereof. So what are we going to do with that? And I say, ensure the continuity that I spoke above on the other side, the continued progress. Because it was definitely not a campaign gimmick when I said we have laid the foundation for progress in this country with four years of stability. Because of those four years of stability, we have approved financial statements. Thanks to the hardworking finance minister and his ministry, Give Jack his jacket. Without those statements, we can't talk about letting go the hand of the CFT. The CFT is based on the RFT, a law, a law that we agreed to at kingdom level. Kingdom level for financial supervision. Is it realistic? The reports, well, we feel no for sure. But the reports need to be executed to give, let's say, the weight to our sentiments to get out from under it at this point. Because we've proven before Hurricane Irma, we had two sets of balanced budgets. But we didn't have the financial statements in place. Now we have not only had balanced budgets, this one is also balanced. It has a surplus. 2023 had a surplus. And we have the financial statements up to date. And we have budget room to be able to take loans. Unlike our other sister countries in the kingdom, we have the budget room. So is there risk, Madam Chair? Yes, there's risk. There's risk because we live in a hurricane belt. There's risk because any other disaster can befall us like it befell us in 2020. Which country was ready for that risk? 
How many big developed countries didn't go belly up? How many big developed countries didn't need assistance from the same EU partners and had conditions similar, if not worse than ours, as independent countries with years, hundreds of years of independence? In fact, the Dutch anthem now says something about the king of Spain, but Spain had to go borrow from the Netherlands. So, Madam Chair, let's not fool the people of St. Martin. Let's ensure that they understand what this budget means. And the fact that outgoing ministers come and sit there and take whatever questions come, even though they were in the presentation, even though they were in the elucidation to the budget, which is pro project-based in the elucidation, which is policy-based, sorry, that you can go and see which policies are being attached. And as a matter of fact, Radvan Advis is saying they're seeing so much improvement since these four years in what type of laws are coming up to them. Of course, there's still room to grow. And that's why we are now, with the necessary budget room, able to provide the training to our civil servants and hire more civil servants. Because I understand, I think, the question of the MP in terms of budgeted FTEs, actual FTEs that, uh, sorry, function book established FTEs vis-a-vis -vis budgeted FTEs per year vis-a-vis -vis how many are actually filled. And I know since my first time in 2012 that that is a challenge. But guess what? In 2012, we had bare bones budget. Look at the numbers our minister presented. Revenue and expenses comparison. Do you see from 2022, we went from budgets of 472 and 477 to in 2024, 573 and 575? Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, members of parliament, Madam Chair, that that's over 100 million more than what we had back in 2022? And if you go back and check what we used to have in 2015, 16, 17, and 18, we couldn't even hit 450 million. We all want to do more. We all want to do more. But we got to be realistic of what can be done in a particular period of time with the resources we have, with the human beings, as well as the finances. And another thing, Madam Chair, is the actual trajectory of legislation. So the budget is a law. And according to Minister Finance's trajectory, we received, the ministries received an update early February as to what has to be handed in, when, 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 when. Unfortunately, for 2025, certain documents are already being prepared. So if the new government doesn't sit soon, you'll also have almost little to no impact on your 2025 budget. That's how it works. By May, it needs to be done. Everybody needs to have submitted their wish list so that finance ministry could do what they have to do to get it to parliament by September. In the summer when parliament on break, government don't have breaks. Let me just remind. Government and its workers don't have breaks. Yes, the workers are entitled to vacation. And I can tell you from experience, many don't get to take their vacations. So I'm very happy to see the pictures of the recruitment drive in the Netherlands and see government of St. Martin represented because last year we wasn't able to send people. We were late. Eswa Bay had to help us out. And I don't think many people understand what SOA Bay is to government. We finance, and if you look at the budget well, we finance the SOA Bay. It's an audit plan, but within that audit plan, there are a bunch of activities that take place that assist the government of St. Martin. So yes, we do have that option to get that external auditor to assist us, to ensure sometimes that things go a certain way, where we lack the internal personnel to do it. 
So I want to thank them also over these four years for their assistance. Madam Chair, I'm going to go back now a little bit to a statement made about resilience. I think especially since we started the circle of positivity and the positivity workshops and uh, mental health awareness uh, trainings and workshops in government, you know, I understand why people may be tired of the word resilience. But when I say that it still best describes St. Martin, I'm talking about in times of disasters, in times of when things get rough and hard, that we, from experience, know that through the grace of God and the hard work of our people, we will get through it. We will get through it. And barring any other unforeseen negative circumstances, we will definitely thrive. And that is the goal of the NDV, Madam Chair. That we make use of every thing that happens to us to create an opportunity to grow. And I must say we've done that after hurricanes. And we're doing that post-COVID, where you were forced to digitalize faster than you were prepared for. So then you saw that it could happen. But certain things still go according to a scheme and a plan. So any incoming government would need to take the time to really understand what is happening at the ground level. Look at where their plans intersect with the plans that are already ongoing because they are part of the budget plan 2024. And of course, if the amendment can be made during this budget handling, Madam Chair, you have the prerogative to amend the budget at any point during the year, which is why also this budget is late because of the amendments to 2023's budget, which went all the way down to December of last year. So the draft was ready, but once you make changes to 23, it impacts 24. So you must therefore also adjust 24. And that's why that was also finished sometime late draft-wise in December and could start its trajectory to the Council of Advice and other entities that have to look and give their advice. So it behooves us as incoming government, outgoing government, but definitely as members of parliament to ensure we understand the processes that we want to hold accountable understand the processes that the civil servants have to undertake and where all it have to travel before it gets to a minister, before it gets to the Council of Advice, goes back, gets another report, which means address all of the questions, queries, and suggestions and advices of the Council of Advice that you deem necessary, report on it, and then send it on for ratification. So everything is a trajectory, Madam Chair. And so the opportunities that we have received based on improved kingdom relations have not only led to us getting the necessary assistance to be able to balance our budgets back when we did not have the funds, but to build on our collections, on our compliance, and all of the other areas in which we have raised the revenues of this government of St. Martin post-COVID that it has become now sustainable, that it will continue to grow, and that the people of St. Martin will continue to benefit from it. And so I ask that we ensure that we support all of the things that need to be done to ensure this budget get passed, and that we work together to ensure that it can be executed. Whether while we are still here, or with the incoming government. Because the civil servants, as I said on the other side, will be the biggest losers if we, as my good MP mentioned, <laughs> put a heart to the forward progress that they have started to experience. Madam Chair, I look forward to hearing any further debate that will come forth from 
this budget debate in the hope that we can get to the point where we can say for or against, and the people of St. Martin can know whether we can continue to move forward or if we're going to be halted. I thank you, Madam Chair. MP Jacobs, thank you for your presentation. And I will now adjourn for six minutes until 10 minutes past six. Meeting adjourned.
And please, if you could take your seats, please. Welcome back, members of parliament and those joining us online or via, please settle in the hall, via other means to this uh, public meeting. I'll just move right on to the next speaker, MP Sarah Westcott-Williams. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady, and a good evening. A good evening to my colleagues. A good evening to all persons tuned into this meeting. Special welcome to those in the Tribune who have been with us a while as we continue handling the draft budget 2023. The speakers before me have asked several questions in follow-up to the answers that we received from the ministers and made some comments in connection with these answers. Allow me, therefore, not to carry on too long with this debate, get some more answers or clarifications to answers given from the ministers in order to determine my own position on the budget, notwithstanding the plea of passing the budget in order to make certain things happen. I don't know if that is necessarily so, and I'll explain why. But firstly, let me ask some clarifications and indicate to the ministers who have not responded or responded completely to the questions that I posed in the Central Committee meeting. I thank those ministers who, who have very lengthy presented answers and information to the members of parliament. I want to start with the Minister of Finance. And of course, this budget um, is late. And one of the reasons that we have heard about the particular situation we find ourselves in now with the budget is based on the letter that was sent to the government of St. Martin by the CFT, in which a deadline was mentioned of March 31st or otherwise. What that or otherwise could be could mean a lot of things. One, the CFT following that date could inform, would, not could, would inform the Kingdom Council of Ministers that St. Martin does not yet have a budget for 2024. The Kingdom Council of Ministers could say that's their business. The Kingdom Council of Ministers could say, I give you a week more. The Kingdom Council of Ministers could say, well, this is enough now, guys. I'm going to bring down a more firm instruction. Given that introduction, I want to know from the Minister of Finance, I heard him refer, Madam Chair Lady, to the fact that the CFT was not consulted on this draft budget. And in this stage of the budget, the government does not have to consult the CFT. They can. They can ask the CFT on a draft budget their opinion. When the budget is passed by parliament, then yes, 
that budget needs to go to the CFT. An approved budget needs to go to the CFT. An approved amended budget needs to go to the CFT. So I would like to ask the Minister of Finance, was absolutely no consultation, formal or informal, held with the CFT about the draft budget now before us? And please don't repeat that it, you don't have to. I know that. I'm asking, if notwithstanding that, if any consultation was, was had. And I ask this looking at the discussion regarding sale of government-owned shares, and in particular, winner shares. I want to get back to the Minister of Finance on the matter of the Central Bank for Curacao and St. Martin and the dividend policy of this bank or the lack thereof. The last year that we received, according to what I received from the government of St. Martin, any type of dividend from the Central Bank was 2019, and it was an amount of 600,000 guilders. So when I now read that it's going to be on the basis of dividend payments that the government of St. Martin will make its contribution to the Enya debacle, then I ask myself, and asking myself, I ask the government and the Minister of Finance, what is the Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin going to do differently in order to make sufficient profit to yield a dividend that would be at least 2.3, 2.5 million guilders, when the last dividend of the bank was 600,000 guilders, according to the information from the minister himself, and that was in 2019. What are the, fine, the big financial aspects of the Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin. So could that be provided? Could we get some insight into that since 2019 when they were able to pay 600,000 guilders and the years thereafter when they could not? Was it that they were creating reserves? Was it that they didn't make any profit? And somewhere between the lines referenced in the elucidation to this budget is made to increasing Banking fees, I want to know to how much, when, is this going to start in 2027? So if that whole picture regarding the central bank and its contribution that will allow the government starting in 2027 to make its contribution to the INIA situation or INIA solvability, let me call it that, then please present that is my request to the government. What increase in the banking license fee are we looking at in order for the central bank to make a profit so that they then can basically give, as the Dutch man would say, a cigar uit eigen doos, money that they collect. And then they will say, government, we're paying you dividend. So they're going to increase, apparently, the banking license fees make more money, and then say, but we're contributing to you, government, so that you can contribute to India solvability. So I would, I would like that entire picture to be painted. And since the India outline agreement has been reached on a technical level, and the minister has provided some snippets of this agreement, can we receive the agreement? Madam Chair, lady, the before and during the past campaign, there was this discussion about tax withholdings, tax deductions on pensions, on pension. Now, strictly speaking, pensions, the maximum amount of pension received as per the old age pension scheme of the EZV, if that is the only income the person has, there's no tax to be deducted from that amount. If there's no other income the pensioner has. However, what has been happening is that if a pensioner has outstanding taxes from whether before, from whether a spouse, whatever have you, 
there used to be an agreement that the receiver would make with the SZV that this money would automatically be, the old taxes, would automatically be deducted from the pension of the pensioner. When I learned of the government of Curacao saying to their SVB that that was actually illegal, I didn't jump up and scream out, scream murder on St. Martin, but what I did do, I called the SZV and I asked them if that type of an arrangement between as our SZV and the receiver, if you also had that in place on St. Martin? And the answer was yes. And the answer was also, MP, this is going to be stopped as of immediately. But the question was at the time, what happens then to the agreement that the pensioners were made to sign in order to make that deduction possible because that was an ongoing and running agreement. So I say all of this and give this elucidation to ask the Minister of Finance, Minister of Finance are, and the Minister of Public Health, are, were you aware of this situation? One, and can you please inform me as I was unofficially informed that it is no longer happening and that a solution was found for those agreements which were in existence between the pensioner and the SZV. I just want to know that that matter has really been, been cleared up. I want to go to the Minister of Justice. Minister, as I indicated through you, Madam Chair, Lady, um, to the Minister of Justice, there seems to be a shortage or a delay in the Court of Guardianship, correctly now called in the budget documentation, the Guardianship Council, so the complete translation of Vaudeirat in the budget, it's now called the Guardianship Council. And there seems to be an issue of getting foster parents. I was told by a foster parent that the amounts allocated for foster parents to be paid to take care of this child or children is way, way too low. The minister in her responses, Madam Chair Lady, acknowledged that fact and also gave an outline of some of the things to come. And so I ask the minister if there's anything that can be done on short notice where this matter is concerned. I also want to know from the Minister of Justice in reference to this ministry looking at the legislation of the best islands, I want to know how far is the Justice Ministry with the draft legislation as per the best legislation? That was a reference made by the minister, Madam Chair Lady. And so I ask, how far is it? Are we close to? Madam Chair Lady, I, of course, took note of the, our budget, the numbers in the budget, the policy document pertaining to the, to the budget, the necessary changes that needed to be made when we got the answers and parts missing, questions not answered, et cetera, et cetera, all of that that led us to where we are today in the public meeting. So when I see things like, I saw some policies presented even here today, and I would, I would have gotten the impression that some of the ministers are presenting what they will be doing rather than what has been done in the areas that are considered priorities for all of us. For all of us, we hear it all the time. I can't for the life of me imagine that when we talk about addiction in this country, that it is something yet to come. And of course the minister is aware of protect the player when it comes to gambling addiction. But how long do we need to talk and say how much we all feel the pain? 
without actually seeing something concretely done. So when it comes to that particular issue of addiction, and I see turning point budget, and I ask about turning point budget, and I ask whether turning point budget includes the very, very necessary expansion that turning point needs. And yes, there are, of course, good things that happen on St. Martin, that have been happening on St. Martin. But there are also things that we, we keep going back and forth on. When the white yellow cross is just waiting for a signal from EZV in order to give the necessary expansion, waiting list here, waiting list there. Nobody does not, nobody says these are not priorities, but why can't these things, why can't they be addressed? Why haven't they been addressed? Minister of Education, you presented in response to a question of mine, the community school program. You presented all the, now the community school program has been left up to the different school boards, and that's fine. And I see an amount of 240 something thousand for every school board. And I ask, is this based on an overall program for community schools? Or is it because that's the budget we had, so we take it up, we divide it by five or six, and that's what you get? So are we, are we assured that a community school program as a program can be executed? Or are these school boards to take the 240 something thousand guilders and see how best they can manage. The school feeding program, Minister of Education, through you, Madam Chair Lady, is in today's St. Martin. School feeding still in a pilot phase is my question. And if so, why? Has something changed and a new pilot scheme has started and that's what we're checking? Why are we at a pilot stage in the school feeding program? I asked the Minister of Public Health, Labor, and Social Development to kindly provide us with some labor statistics. Unemployment, foreign labor permits, that nice picture that we every so often get. If we could get a current overview of that. All over, throughout, we call the SDGs, we call the NVD, we call them all. What about a poverty study on St. Martin? Because clearly, clearly, the picture that we get painted and the picture that we see are two different pictures. Are two different pictures. I'm not asking about the social registry. I understand that project. And I know that too is taken like forever. But what about a poverty study? You know, it's like, the, it's like the plastic bag ban. We come up with these things long before many others. And we see where steps are taken. And if you have to tweak it along the way, you tweak it. But make a step. Make a step. In the, in the context of a poverty study and the residential care that is part of our budget, I know what it is. And I ask, what about the aspect of homelessness itself? What about the aspect of homelessness? I don't know about anyone else. But I tend to look at persons who clearly are homeless, and you see that amount growing. You see it growing daily. And I ask my, I not ask myself, I'm asking the government, um, where in the residential program and the residential care is the view of a vision on, if any, homelessness. I want to ask the Minister of general affairs. I was trying to count the amount of times that digitalization appears in the budget. I was trying to count it, and I actually 
lost count. I lost count, and so I want to ask the government and the minister responsible for digitalization, who of course have heard and read of the Digital Government Transformation Project. And I ask if the government has a strategy where digitalization is concerned, a sort of a roadmap overall, overall, for actually for the country. Because when I say this, then I ask the, the government, um, digitalization is now waiting on anyone. And when we look at matters like AI, um, is that even in the talks about digitalization and all of that? Are there any priority sectors in this area? Is this government at all involved with UNESCO AI Caribbean Initiative, ISO 42001? And I want to, you know, whether on whatever side of the fence you stand, where it pertains to the Netherlands and whatever assistance they can give and what we can learn or unlearn from them or should learn or should unlearn, I want to, I want to, I want to share with the government the priorities of the Dutch government where it pertains to things like AI. Because if we're going to use the help of the Netherlands, then we should not sell ourselves short. Then let's, let's go for digitalization, AI, and, and all of those. Because listen, listen to the Netherlands priorities, Madam Chair Lady. So they have now a Dutch digitalization strategy looking towards the future. And it describes the following priority themes and actions for the coming years. Artificial intelligence, using data to tackle social issues and stimulate economic growth, Digital inclusion and skills, digital government, digital connectivity, digital resilience, et cetera, et cetera. And the government will be focusing extra attention on these priorities, working with entrepreneurs, and it goes on. So if we are going to be getting all of the help that we are told we are getting, and which was confirmed again to members of parliament, faction leaders, by the state secretary, then I say, go for it. Go for the, the full hog. No, not because we are small. I mean, okay, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna restrict us here, you know, do a little thing in our government. No, 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 no. Then we won't be on that level with you too. Then it's there we dares where we aim in. The same thing can be said for the World Bank. The World Bank is all over the Caribbean doing all the nice things, but here because they're constrained within the box of being um, the administrator of Dutch funds, they got to walk that walk and doing so much of other things. How many webinars have I not, and I'm sure others of you, followed of the World Bank? And I'm like, but we're in the Caribbean too? Why can't we get the kind of assistance like that? No, because they're constrained in this little box administering the trust fund. Minister of Finance, the government owned companies. And I asked about, Madam Chair Lady, a particular overview that was granted, or given rather, in the elucidation to the budget. And it gives an overview of which companies send in to government their annual accounts and which did not. So can the Minister of Finance provide Parliament at this time, Madam Chair Lady, with a current overview of which companies have presented and which are the latest accounts presented by these companies. Because the one that we saw was this one, the last one was 2019, this one didn't do at all, and that kind of an overview. Please provide a current overview. And talking about, talking about government-owned companies, I have to join my colleagues who spoke and asked about Winnear. Now, this plan for Winnear is speckled throughout the elucidation in the budget. And the, the, the Minister of Finance, and I agree with him, in some instances, divestments or divesting is the way to go. When I look at 
When I look at Winnie, I'm trying to understand the plan and the strategy of government. Is the strategy of government divesting overall? So wherever we own shares, we're going to try to get rid of some at least. Or is it in the aviation business that the government is saying, I kind of getting out of that? Where did the 13.4 million guilders come from? How can the government on one hand in the elucidation say, the Winnie plan, so what is the Winnie plan? And where did this number come from? It cannot be so that every area is about, we could plug the budget. Because I'm going to come to another area and ask, is it only about that? Or we could increase revenues. We're going to get 13.4 based on what? And is it the intention to basically get or divest winner completely? When the, when the minister says, Madam Chair Lady, when the minister says to us that management and board of winner are completely behind selling shares, I would like to know if the minister knows what is the premise of them being in favor of. They must know something more than now the government that has 92 point something percent of the, the shares, I think it is, they're going to sell some of those shares, the government shares. So what is expected of the partners who are supposed to buy into these shares? More capital injection into winner, is that it? Is it a, a way of control? Are we looking for expertise in the aviation industry to then be part of Winnie? What, what are we expecting besides the fact that if we sell some shares of Winnie, we get 13.4 million gillas in the budget? So what is the strategy? What is the plan? And it is not sufficient to say, well, we put it in the budget. I can't tell you the plan yet because it is what comes first, the chicken or the egg. No, no, that, that's not an appropriate answer. For the same token, I want to ask economics. And this is the kind of presentation that I referred to earlier. When you look at it and you wonder, huh, is this in the same St. Martin I'm living in? We talk about economic zoning. We have an economic, when I asked the government months ago, Minister of Tiat, what, is it, what economic zoning plan are you using? And the answer was, we got one of 2009. And indeed, on the website of the government, you have the economic residential policy of 2009. Then we go to the, then we go to the business license fees, and in 2022, we collected seven million. The budget 2023, mentions 8.8 .8 million. And then, in this budget, 11.6 million we're going to collect. Based on what? Based on what? On just every request for a business license granted, because after all, it's an income for government. Or are we realizing that in some areas we are to capacity? Are we, Madam Chair Lady? Are we? It is not everything that you can agree to because you could plug a hole in the budget. It can't work like that. So what is the, what is the thinking, the philosophy, the vision of giving off business licenses? And please don't tell me. Oh yeah, you know, we could, we could collect 11.6 million by giving out what kind of licenses? By giving out what kind of licenses is my question. I asked about talking about giving out licenses. And all, the, all the, 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 the hype that we put, all of us, including myself, to the small business sector. But when I ask questions, asking questions for the last year, I'm sure. Forget about the questions I ask about the Phillipsburg market. And several of my colleagues today touched on it again. Remember, remember that place needed to be demolished on the 1st of December, 2023. That's what they were told. And then we wonder, why are persons not happy? We all are working hard after all. We all are showing up, after most of us, after all. 
And why a are, why are person so discontent? Saying that to ask, this is the question I have been asking all along. So what about the vendors on the pond fill, on the ring road? You remember they were to move these persons? The last answer I got to that question was, well, they're there. Yeah, obviously they're there. And then when people continue to just put on little things, and then you say, boy, that place looks so disorganized. And, you know, but we're not, we're not, we're not assisting for it to look better. So what again? Again. And I hope via the acting minister of Romy, I can get an answer. And the minister of Tiyat. What about the vendors on the Pondfield Road and the Ring Road and that area there? Minister of Justice now, if you had answered my question on the why are only nine vacancies mentioned for KPSM and I missed it, then I would kindly like for you to address it once again because I don't have it here as having received an answer. Talk about just allowing things in order to say we're going to get the money in the budget. So I asked about the lottery. Now the lottery fees in the budget of St. Martin amount to three million sixty thousand guilders. We see that for 2022, which should have been actually the actuals. We see it for 2023 budget, and we see it for 2024 budget. So the minister said on me asking, so did we collect that money in 2022? The minister responded and said, no, we didn't collect the three million guilders for lottery fees in 2022 because we budgeted based on, on the accrual basis. So now what that says, we should expect, we are expecting this money. So when the parliament sees it under the column for 2022, it's like, oh, we collected three million guilders in lottery fees. Absolutely not. Because when I ask the minister what were the actual collections for lottery fees, it is nowhere close to three million guilders. Yet, based on the same accrual basis, we put again in 2023 budget, three million sixty thousand guilders. 2024, three million sixty thousand guilders. And nowhere close to that is being paid in lottery fees. And my question would be, why? And then we hear, well, we have a lottery, a lottery, I guess it's a national decree coming into being. And this thing is coming into being for the last four years at least. How come these matters do not get the urgency that, in my opinion, they deserve? How come? No, we ain't collecting no three million guilders. We're even collecting it with the fees that we're supposed to collect now. So what, what about this thing? So, and then we get, and then, and then we have to pay, or we get, 312,000 guilders for lottery oversight. So we have persons who go check the lottery, make sure everything is in order. But we can't collect the money that they got to pay us in fees. Minister of Romy, under the, under the chapter of Romy, there is no amount filled in by hindrance permits. And I think one of my colleagues had asked it, is it because there were none? Or is it because it's somewhere else we gotta look for it? The same thing for subdivisions. No requests for such, or is it that we did not, it's not booked right? I keep coming back to this item for the Minister of VSA. I've heard answers to it. And every time again, the CFT would mention it, and that is the personal contribution to medical expenses for government workers. According to the law, they should be paid a personal contribution after a certain scale to medical expenses. And my question is, is this matter going to be addressed in one way or another when it comes to whatever we're going to call our new sickness coverage scheme? And let me make something very clear here. When I talk about universal 
health coverage, I talk about the UHC that is part of the Sustainable Development Goals. I think 13 and I think target eight. Could be wrong, but somewhere there, okay? That's what I talk about. I've also spoken about the need, in my opinion, and that's why I'm constantly asking the minister, minister, where is the reparation legislation? And I have been told that it either is with the Council of Advice or backed by the government to respond to the Council of Advice. And I want to stand still a moment here and then ask the Minister of General Affairs if it can be checked out for me whether the website of the Council of Advice is up to date where persons like members of parliament can see exactly what draft legislation has been submitted to the Council of Advice. Right now, it doesn't show me that there is something to do with SZV legislation. It doesn't show me any of the El Bay Hams to which the government has referred on several occasions in this very budget. So is it that they need to upload these documents still? Is it that they can't if the Minister of General Affairs can inform me of this? It was the same thing some time ago, and I went straight to the Council of Advice and asked, what about the website? And eventually, it was brought up to date, but again, in my opinion, it, is not, it does not reflect the most up-to-date submissions by the government. That's my question. Because I don't see, for example, another, I don't know what you want to call it of mine, but that is the matter that I have been asking the minister about where it pertains to the increase of the welfare, so the understand, and the decree that the government needs to give to make that possible because the minimum wage has been increased. I don't see that mentioned nowhere on the website of the, of the Council of Advice. As I mentioned, neither do I see the information regarding the SZV regulation. Unfortunately, in some areas in the budget, we see that matters have been either referred to the SER or needed to skip the SER because of the issues confronted by the SER. And so my question is, are we no further with this matter of having a functional SER than we were three years ago, to mention a random date? And now I need the Minister of Education's attention. We have in the CAPEX budget 2024 a very, very I don't want to use the word peculiar, but it sure is interesting investment by the government of St. Martin. And it is under the chapter of the Charlotte Brookson Academy, a very detailed plan of what would seem to be an awesome campus. And this is under the CAPEX budget of the government of St. Martin. And then they make reference to the fact that, well, you know, this campus once built can be used by others. So what comes to mind immediately? Government, where are your plans for a national theater for the performing arts? And then leave the schools make use of that. 12 million guilders. We got a John Lamini School, not John Lamini, John Lamini Center repairs separated in two phases. We got a Phillipsburg Cultural Center that is in dire need of renovations. Why can't we once and for all decide how we are going to structure the facilities for the performing arts on St. Martin. And unless the government can give me, the Minister of Education can give me a solid answer. How, under, under what, under, what are the conditions that you, government of St. Martin, is going to put in your CAPEX um, budget, building a campus 
for a non-government school? Is it going to be a loan to the school? Is it going to be some arrangement with the school? Explain it, because again, the plan is there like it's ready to go. And what happens to us? So I want to see, I want to hear from the minister clearly how that structure is supposed to work in terms of the financial part of it, in terms of the management part of it. And then I want to know, so then why did we separate the John Lamini Center um, repairs or expansion? That's what it is. Why, can't we, why haven't we included the Phillipsburg Cultural Center in these things? So, Minister, I need a good, good answer from you. So, if, if tomorrow, if tomorrow, school, not wanting to mention any name, school X comes with a beautiful plan that includes, I don't know what, and government has CAPEX availability, can that school present its complete plan and the government will finance it, is my question. All through the budget, all through the budget, we hear two things. Execution capacity. The 2023 budget, the CAPEX budget, we just got the opportunity to make use of it. In fact, that needed to roll over to the 2024 CAPEX, which also includes hundreds of millions of guilders. Is this realistic? Is it realistic? Yeah, we could get a loan because we're under the norm to get loans. So, but is it, is it realistic? Is my question when it comes to capacity. The, and was it not capacity that actually kept the vendors, village, and marketplace from happening yet? Or was it something else? Is my question. Some of us, including the Minister of General Affairs, the Prime Minister, were at the border on the 23rd of March as we observed the Treaty of Concordia. Now, again, on this, like on several things, there's a whole debate going on about the Treaty of Concordia. Should we observe it? Should we not observe it? Should we be happy for it? Should we not be happy for it? Because of who wrote it? Did they write it for us? Did they write it for themselves? Was it for economic reasons? Was it whatever, whatever, whatever? Regardless of that, as I stated, after I attended the ceremony was, I don't really care who wrote it. Fact is that we live in it. And that's what is important. And I say that to ask, because now, of course, this discussion about revamping, rewriting, renewing the Treaty of Concordia has been ongoing. In fact, we have several cooperation agreements with our French brothers and sisters. And so I asked the government, the Minister of General Affairs, if we can be provided as a parliament with all the existing agreements between the northern side and the southern side. All the agreements we have, we had in, in transportation, we had it in justice, we had one actually sort of rewriting the Treaty of Concordia, many of them. So could we have a package to understand these are the agreements that govern the relationship between French and Dutch? Talking about government-owned companies, we learned several interesting things here in this budget debate. One, first I want to ask, we asked about the EDC, and we got a lengthy answer and we got what, are now, what is now in the statutes of the EDC. And I want to find out, are those same objectives currently in the statutes of the EDC? So the ones that were given in the answers to members of parliament, are they the same objectives? Because those objectives are many and lengthy. Basically, the EDC, following what we got for their objectives, is basically in control of the whole economic development of this country. That's how, the, that's, how, that's how the objectives are listed for the EDC. So I want to know, one, is there a business plan for the EDC currently? Is there, a, is there is it, are those statutes still in place? So that's what this corporation is going to be doing. Everything that, 
economic di development, economic diversification, economic proliferation, everything. Everything economic will be done by the EDC. Is that still the case? Is that is what is applicable today? And then I would like to know, I haven't heard, I see a lot, but I haven't heard much about how the management of the lagoon is currently. Boats in and out and thing and fish it and for conks and you, I mean, you name it. So, but how is the management right now taking place? How, how, is, Slack, how is Slack operating? You know, what, what, we, what, what, are, we, what are we getting? Uh, yeah, yeah, so since Slack was with EDC and no longer is, how are we going? How is the lagoon management going? And then a very interesting decision by the government to go buy a boat. And that's why I'm asking about the lagoon management. So how is that going? That the government now is going to buy its boat to go control, I guess, the lagoon? And I mean, like, really? You got the SLA with the Nature Foundation, which you observe when it is convenient to observe. But you're going to go buy a boat. I mean, OK. So yeah, so please explain better the position of the government to acquire a boat. As I asked earlier, are the EDC articles the same as back in 1998, and do they have a business plan? The TLM. TLM, could we be provided with an update on TLM, where things stand now, Madam Chair, lady? But more, not more importantly, just as important, let me say it that way, with respect to TLM and the issues that they're facing, primarily financial issues, and having to take certain decisions based on these issues, are there any perceived risks for national security because of TLM's woes? TLM is the one that is, from what we have read, um, responsible for the CCTV system. Um, you know, are these things, are the things that TLM is providing as a national service, are these matters in jeopardy, in jeopardy because of what TLM is, is, is facing at this time or not? So could that be answered? Can the minister of VSA inform me of any progress with respect to the steps survey? You know, do we have any, any, any details? It is no secret for the minister or the government that I am very concerned, have been, remain, and get even more concerned about the health of this nation. Health, overall, mental health, I mean, you name it. It's, it. For me, it is worrying. And I'm going to ask a question in this context that is sensitive, but I want to know, what is our mortality rate for the last, I would say, six years. Yeah, six years. Let's, let's, let's go like right after the hurricane, kind of, and get an overview of that. You know, there is something right now that is playing in other parts of the kingdom in which they're talking about um, oversterfte. Oversterfte. Now, what that actually means is that is there an unexplainable difference in the mortality rate? That's, that's what. And what would that be based on? So I'm just asking, could we get the mortality rate of this country for the last couple of years? Now, I want to share with you the policy priorities of Romi as presented to us by the, by the government in its elucidation to the, to the budget. And it states as follows. The main features of the policy priorities and actions of the Ministry of Romi are one, increased use of renewable energy to reduce the ecological footprint. Two, 
Our national resources, for example, soil, water, beaches, ponds, mountains, forests, biodiversity, caves, are protected and or sustainably restored in quality for future generations. Three, introducing more stringent measures to prevent public pollution of social spaces and the natural environment. Our environment should not be polluted haphazardly. Four, there is a sustainable, comprehensive waste management system with effective recycling and reuse. Five, our wastewater disposal is done in a way that wastewater no longer contributes to a negative impact on the health of the community and pollution of the environment. Six, promote compliance with environmental regulations, norms, and values should be the order of the day, according to the government. So now I want to ask some very specific question. No, firstly, a general question. Could the government please just indicate a few areas, very specifically, where these priorities have been observed? where these priorities have been observed. And then I want to ask some very specific questions. Who is controlling the project at Bel Air? Who is controlling that project there? Why is all of that stuff dumb there? To do what? Specifically. So tell me what happened in there. I, whenever I pass it, I wonder, and I'm asking the government. So what's, what's going on there? What is going on there? Then, as a road user, as you may know, and not always during daylight time, I would like to know if the building on the Union Road at the entrance of Carrefour, more or less, so the former Caribbean Auto, I think, was there, that building. So now, Coincidentally, last night walking the road, I realized that this construction has taken up what could have been considered a sidewalk. And so, are they going to put back a sidewalk? Are people going to be able to walk there? So, who controls this when we have such a lack of capacity? It's one thing to give out building permits and to get the money for the building permits, but if you can't control what is being done, it makes no sense to give a building permit. It makes absolutely no sense. Then tell everybody, bill as you want, because we can't control what you're doing. But those two in particular, and I got some more, but those two I would like to know. Because if I leave here now, and I decide to go walk up to the border to check to see if the, if the read the bouquet, whatever we put on there on the 23rd, it's still fresh, I have to pass there. And I have to walk in the road. I actually have to walk on the road. So I would like to know. So, so give me, I just mentioned them there. They can be found on page 114 of the elucidation. Just, just mention for me here, yeah, MP, where it pertains to wastewater. We have done just this and that and the other. In this area, the environment, the beaches, one, two. How, 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 how effective are we making use of the Nature Foundation SLA? How effective are these persons? Are they consulted? Must they be consulted according to the SLA for different projects and, and buildings and whatever else? And then I ask, I ask for the Ministry of Romi to address for me Article 526 of the Civil Code of St. Martin. And, um, and so I got an answer to tell me, but you know, the beaches are presumed to be in the ownership of the government. Yeah, damn, damn much I know. I want to, I want, and so let me be specific. When I say Article 5, Book 5, my bad, Article 26, I want to say paragraph two. Do not repeat paragraph one for me. That I understand. But when you have the civil code, that says, and let me see what it says. Well, I could kind of tell it to you by heart somewhat. But it does say, and I paraphrase, that any, anything going on, any permission to be given for anything to go on, on the beaches, 
whether to put down, to give it in use, whatever the case may be, do you need special bizondre to stemming by national ordinance? All I have been asking the government since I don't know when, just explain me how you are executing Civil Code, Book 5, Article 26, Paragraph 2. That's all I want. How are you executing that? Has the fact that it should happen by national ordinance, that wasn't a slip of the tongue, national ordinance, how is it that everything can go on on our beaches without even a national decree? Was that a sign? Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought I was getting a time sign. The, um, thank you, Madam Chair Lady. And so I really would like to know, has this been mandated to a lower level? That's, that's really my question. Has that by national ordinance stipulation been mandated to a lower level? And then, government, you tried a thing here with me. I ask, was there a court injunction filed by or on behalf of Sun Resort against the government? In first instance, I was like, no, we don't have any court cases going on. I'm like, okay, then my understanding was wrong. That could happen. So now the minister sends me the The minister sends me now a reminder from the court that they have to carry out the decision made in November of last year. And I still don't know what the decision of November last year is. So to make it short, please send me the decision that the court is now giving you a time period within which you have to reply to the, I guess, Sun Resort. And I think, in fact, that, that that paperwork that we got from the government, um, that time would have been up sometime now because I think it was on the 19th of February, they were given either uh, three or four weeks or somewhere now things, the government had to react. Did they react? Just send me the whole thing. I can't, I can't understand half of a story. Just give, give me the, what was the November verdict? What was the November decision? What, whatever it was. The, and now I want to come to the issue of capacity and technical assistance. Because again, we sat and we listened to the state secretary tell us that, but anything that you guys need to build capacity, we can provide it. Why is then legislation still a problem on St. Martin? Why? Why? Why don't we grab on to the things that will have us progress, regardless of who could help us. If we can't get our legislation in place, and with technical assistance we can get 15, 16, 20 pieces of legislation written, then let's do that. Nobody should determine what our agenda is for us. We know that's what we need in order to move forward, then that's what we go after. That's what we go after. In fact, Talking about legislation, a report about the legislation function of the government of St. Martin has been written. Has been written a report. And so I asked the government, with the recommendations coming out of that report, where do we stand? Where do we stand? Why can't we take up that report and say, hmm, you want to help us? These are the recommendations. These we can do. These we cannot do. So assist. Put your money where your mouth is. So we got our legislation report. I would like to know uh, the review of the legislation function in government, I think it's called, paraphrasing. And I would like to know what was done with the recommendations. OK, now let's get to some brass tacks here. The, the matter of the vacation allowance legislation. Prime Minister, Minister of General Affairs, Madam Chair, Lady, and I had a little interaction on that matter because I could not see, like they, we were told in first instance, that the percentage of vacation allowance could be changed by a LBA ham. Uh-uh. 
because the percentage of vocational allowance is regulated by law, national ordinance. So to change it from six to seven to eight, it would have to be by national ordinance. Since we reach that understanding that that is what has to happen, meaning the law to change it has to come to parliament after going through the process, then I ask, are we going to be ready in time with the legislation to pay out the vacation allowance? If we will not be, can the vacation allowance still be paid out when it should be paid out based on the fact that we have an approved budget? Madam Chair, lady, you get my question, and if I can get the answer. So, the vacation allowance legislation, the national ordinance needs to be changed in order for us to increase the percentage. Vacation allowance is paid out in June. Will we have that law ready by June, by that date? It's not a, it's not a big change, huh? It's just we move it from 6% to 7 and then to 8 and we build in the eight for when it will become eight. But if that is not rat passed and ratified by June when the civil servants are to be paid their vacation allowance, can it be paid out based on the fact that the money has been reserved in this budget, which I hope will pass? Madam Chair, lady, the, so I need, I need to hear two things very, very clearly. In fact, I would prefer that it be presented to me in a paper. So in writing, on a paper, in writing. And that is the matter of winning. I really want to understand the government's plan, the government's vision, and whether this 13.4 million is not similar to when the tourist tax was put in the budget in 2023 and at nearly the end of the year needed to be taken out. So I want, I really want to understand that. I hope there's a vision behind the sale of a part of Winnea shares and not just to plug the budget. I will need to understand that. I need to understand from the Minister of Education clearly this whole setup in the CAPEX budget for under the, under the nomer of a new campus for Charlotte Brookson. Is that what it really is based on the plans in the budget? And then, so please explain me that so that I know whether I should come with a motion regarding winner, whether I should come with one regarding the capex of 12 million guilders to make sure we got something that will lead in the direction of a national theater for the performing arts. And then, Madam Chair, lady, I, I, I need a minister of, of VSA to, to, to understand and support this. It will come as no surprise to him. And screening, screening of our men and women, especially women for different diseases, and hopefully by that preventive action we can save lives. So, the minister of VSA has a, a post under collective preventive services for 750,000 guilders. And I would like that to be increased with 50,000 guilders. I am not getting into a discussion right now whether um, the the, the, the 50,000 should come from another budget post, but we do have a little overage in the budget. So the budget has a small positive, um, a small positive amount over positive. Yeah, that's what it means. And I would want to suggest that that positive balance in the budget be lowered with the 50,000 that I would like to add to the post of the VSA ministry to start the process of coming to screening. Because in the draft budget 2024, the topic of preventive care appears many times, especially the preventive medical care. I believe that given 
the last couple of years through the input of organizations such as Positive Foundation, Electrolyte Heart and Stroke Foundation, the St. Martin Medical Center, the AUC, the CPS of the VSA ministry, just to name a few, because of their input and dedication, the consciousness of the population regarding screening has been increased. More men and women are more and more making use of the possibility to be screened for especially the diseases such as cancer and heart diseases. I believe that where we are right now with the screening at particular times in the year, I think that we are at a point that we can come to a general screening program with national objectives. And I know it's not an easy thing, but I believe it's very, very necessary. And we can ask, where do you start? Well, in order to answer this question, where do we start, especially within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, where, in some cases, it is mandatory to do certain screenings, I took contact with the Foundation for Prevention, Fundación Prevention, up on Curacao. And that foundation is actually, they coordinate the screening on the island of Curacao. This foundation, which has been created since 2008, is subsidized by the government of St. Martin and others, and they manage and coordinate the screening for breast cancer, for stomach cancer, and for cervical cancer. Mrs. Elstack of that foundation has been found very willing, in fact, has been found enthusiastically willing to assist St. Martin to set up such a screening program on St. Martin, and of course, based on St. Martin. And in my opinion, the first steps would mean a stakeholders consultation on St. Martin, assisted by a team of that foundation on Curacao. And so, while I believe that within the ministry of VSA, there are several areas where that could be organized and financed, I thought rather than go into that discussion, take 50,000 from here, put it there under this project, that project, that I would ask, or I'm proposing to amend the budget to put a 50,000 guilders under the post 43489.7250, ministry of VSA, and that then the balance in the budget be reduced with a 50,000, and we can start this process by inviting those to whom I just refer to the first consultation on, on St. Martin regarding coming to a screening, whether we, it becomes a center, whether we definitely have to work with the organizations that we work with today, and but we need to, we need to push screening health screenings on St. Martin for more than one reason. I look forward, Madam Chair Lady, to receiving the information, especially the one on the, on the mortality rate because these matters tie in to what I just brought forward. And um, I, look, I look forward to the responses clear and, 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 and direct and I Yes, so I look forward to the responses from the ministers of government, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, MP Sarah Westcott-Williams. I will, uh, members of parliament, we've come to the end of the uh, speaker's list for right now and the questions. I will uh, adjourn for 10 minutes to caucus with the government to see how we proceed further. So meeting adjourned until 7.31, 10 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, uh, members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, those still with us. Um, we've reconvened just to inform that uh, the Minister of VSI will be ready to come back and begin answering his questions at 7.45. So I, I will adjourn for 10 minutes until 7.45, at which point we will resume with the Minister of VSI beginning to answer your questions posed in the first round. Meeting adjourned till 7.45.
Welcome back, <clears throat> members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'd like to go right in to the answering of the questions by the Minister of VSA. Uh, the questions posed to him in this first round. So Minister VSA Omar Atli, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Without further ado, I'll dive right into the answers. MP Arundel, are you aware of the different complaints from the therapists on late payment received from SFV? SFV is aware and is mostly due to budget constraints and OZR issues. However, recently the government increased the monthly payment to avoid further increase of backlog. While we are working on a, the additional lump sum contribution to cover the backlog, that currently exists. How will the tourist tax be implemented? Will it be placed at the departure hall or arrival? The draft law has been written with the intention for the monies to be collected a online or upon arrival at the PGIA. Monies will be deposited directly to the government coffers and is not to be included in the tickets. Discussions were held with the SHDA and the, in addition, the draft is currently at the sale to get the input, input of all stakeholders. For hospital helipad, MP Emmanuel, who is paying for it? Where are we getting the helicopter from? The helicopter platform is for transportation of patients from Sabre and Stacia. The best is paying for the platform and the helicopter. It is not the intent that SMMC will buy a helicopter. Do you believe that vaping products should be banned? I do not believe that vaping products should be banned, but however, I do believe that stricter penalties and enforcement is needed for those who sell to underage persons and consequences for those who are using and they are underage. MP Mingret. Could each ministry provide an update on the CAPEX? VSA does not have any capital expenditures. MP Roseburg, what are the budgeted initiatives from the Department of Community Development, Family, Humanitarian Affairs? MP Roseburg, for further elucidation, please see page 99 to 100. However, we have the small home repair project the Community Council pilot project, empowerment programs, women's self-defense training programs specifically for elderly, like computer literacy programs, exercise classes, um, elderly screening program, community outreach initiatives in collaboration with the NGOs, awareness campaign for various international days, such as International Women's Day, International Men's Day, World AIDS Day, etc. Disaster management information sessions regarding being prepared, identifying risk in your community, and shelter management. Monitoring the organizations of safe haven, transitional shelters, and the Belvedere Community Center. How many are employed and what are their tasks? Eight employees with their tasks ranging from conducting assessments, analyzing and reporting findings, deriving from findings, from the findings, programs and project development, facilitating info sessions and workshops, monitoring of organizations, conducting house visits, case management, support and co-execute policies with regards to target groups. Also submit critical points for development of policy, law, and regulations pertaining to development, family, humanitarian affairs. <coughs> Ensure community work through collaboration with community center, community councils, and NGOs. How is the community development being measured? Are there objective and pillars <coughs> the department aims towards? Community engagement increase community participation in the goals of fostering a more cohesive community. Education and training department in collaboration with the NGOs are solely facilitate, solely facilitates adult literacy program, positive parenting programs, budgeting programs, empowerment programs, and more. 
Disaster Preparedness and Recovery, Adult Literacy Program, Mistake. Measures taken to increase community resilience to natural disasters, including hurricane preparedness initiative. As said, such as info sessions, understand the risk within the community and community risk management. Recreational opportunities are also available. Organizations of sporting and recreational events with the goal of enriching community lifestyle. Are they visible in the communities? Yes, they are visible in the community. However, their presence is expected to be increased further in 2024 and beyond, as this aligns with one of the department's primary goals. As I stated in my presentation before we threw you, Madam Chair, community development is an integral part <coughs> of St. Martin Society and definitely should always be increased and enhanced. Does the CDFHA outreach work and how is this organized? Yes, the CDFHA conducts outreach through collaboration with various departments within the ministry, with NGOs, faith by organization, FBOs, organizing community family funding, collaborating with secondary schools, conducting focus groups, discussions, and more. Additionally, Transex Walks will be organized in quarter two of this year. Would like a copy of the MR regarding the work relationship between the ministries. Yes, MP, through you, Madam Chair, this will be shared to the CRIFIL to disseminate to the members of parliament. I move to the question of MP De Weaver. In regards to work permit, is there any plan to increase the fees for work permit? It was and still is the intention to increase the fees of work permits, at least the intention of this government. I move to the questions of MP Sarah Westcott Williams. Are you aware of the situation with pensioners being taxed? Once pension, be, wait, are you, I'm mixing up the questions. Are you aware of the situation of pension is being taxed? Can you inform me that this is no longer happening and the solution has been found regarding the agreement? So once pensioners' sole income is AOV pension, they are not taxed. But you are referring to the process of withholding pensioners' tax from pensioners who have outstanding. This practice has since been immediately stopped. The other aspect of the question as what happens with the agreement with the tax office and the pensioner would have to be answered by finance. But um, from my aspect as Minister of VSA, through you, Madam Chair, that has indeed been stopped. Can, can we get an overview of the labor statistics? Please see information that will be provided to the SG of Parliament for the members of Parliament to see. So these are documents required that I have to send through USG. I see you looking. <laughs> what about the poverty study? The first preliminary study was being worked on, however, was to be completed only when we obtain updated census information. Now that the 2022 census information is newly available, we hope that it can be finalized. It will be the intention of my person for my time being there to proceed with it and hopefully um, the incoming government will continue this process. Regarding our budget allocation for residential care, what measures are in place to address homelessness within this framework? Under residential care in the budget, this is the shelter rehabilitation program being put in place to tackle homelessness and rehabilitate citizens back into the community. However, the aspect of homelessness itself needs to be addressed as it is an interministerial project as this pertains to lack of available low-income <coughs> houses and assisted living institutions. What about the increase of financial aid? I did not see this on the website. 
the increase of financial aid is currently at the said and the exit in a way simultaneously. Therefore, it will not be on the website. In reference to the SLV 1B, I cannot explain why this is not on the Council of Advice site. But however, I can say here in Parliament, we did receive the advice from the Council of Advice, and we are currently working on the NADA report. I cannot explain why the SZV 1B is not seen on the Council of Advice site. That is very strange. Please provide an update or detail on the step survey. Your step survey is at 60% completion with five interv 15 interviewers in the field and seven blood collectors. To complete the survey, about 1,000 more survey completions and about 600 more blood tests are needed. The progress has been slow but steady. Phase three of the marketing campaign <laughs> will be launched in April. And through you, Madam Chair, I too am a proponent that data <coughs> is needed as the last data we have was the How Healthy is St. Martin in 2015, the last data survey. What is the mortality rate for the last six years? Unfortunately, MP, we will continue to try, but this has been a difficult, uh, one of the difficulties that the department has faced getting information from the different organizations. And this is the reason we are trying to develop the HIS, the health information system, to have more connectivity um, with our healthcare providers, the medical center, and et cetera. We have had very different difficulties receiving this information from our healthcare providers. Number seven. Personal contribution to medical expense, is that a matter that is going to be addressed? Yes, MP, indeed. If the SAHA does not materialize, this will have to be addressed, even if it means premium increase as opposed to the 10% contribution currently in the law. So what I'm saying right here is that the SAHA will do away with the personal contribution that you speak of if it is passed, if it's not passed, then we have to consider different options, such as I stated in the Central Committee meeting, possibility of premium increase or revert back to collecting the 10% from the civil servants, which are currently not collected. Is the contribution of sickness co coverage going to be higher? We went from four. 0.5 million monthly to 5.5. The intention is to do another increase. However, under the Saha Atli Care, the government's contribution will increase, is expected to increase to an amount of 10 million monthly. What agreements do you have with the French side? We currently have the signed agreement on the signed MOU, water agreement with the French side. This MOU has been sent to the Prime Minister, as you also asked through you, Madam Chair, for the Prime Minister to give you all relation, working relationship with the front side. Increase on screening of men and women. What is the Minister's thoughts? I fully, fully support increase of screening. I agree with the notion that prevention is always better than cure. And again, Madam Chair, through you, MP Sarah Westcott Williams, most of your questions I revert back to the Saha slash Atli Care slash General Health Insurance, whatever it may be called, as in this we will now cover preventative measures such as screening. So I do agree 100%. Hence why I say it is imperative, whether it's this government, the next government, that we pass this Saha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister Otley, for the answers to the question. Before we move over to clarifications, I just have uh, one point regarding the documentation you mentioned. When um, can Parliament then expect to receive it? Just so that we... Okay. And with that, um, Members of Parliament, you've heard the answers from the Minister of VSA. So I would open the floor for clarifications, if any member has clarifications on the answers provided. 
I see MP Sarah Westcott Williams, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady, and thanks to the Minister for his responses. And if he can clarify the following for me. The, the Minister indicated that the census information, which is now available and is to be formalized, that I, uh, I'm asking if I understood it right, and then the, the poverty study can be done, or from the census information, the, pov the poverty situation will be determined. You know, so will there be, as a follow-up, a poverty study in terms, or is the information from the census sufficient to determine this is the poverty state of St. Martin, is my question. And then the minister indicated that in order to, to give and determine to give and or determine the mortality rate, what is necessary, it has been difficult collecting information from the different organizations, and that's why it's imperative to have the health information system in place. Um, while I understand that in having a breakdown of, the, um, of that rate, um, what about just the numbers from the census office in terms of the deaths? So while I know we can't get like a mortality rate based on the different, um, the different reasons and for deaths, but just give us then the ballpark number of, of that. So um, those are the only two clarifications that I want to get answered. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott. I will now give the floor to MP Shamira Roseberg to provide her clarifications. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the um, answering of my questions, Minister. But I think one question was missed in regards to what the current government or the Ministry of ASA has been doing to attract legal minds um, to the government or to St. Martin, seeing that I have understood in the different presentations that there is that there are not enough legal minds um, on the islands or in government. So I would like to have that question answers to you, Madam Chair. That was a question to all the ministers, by the way. Thank you, MP Roseberg. Next, um, for clarifications, MP Christoph Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I asked a few questions concerning the, the Hilly part. I think I want to be sure in clarifications that the minister got all of them correct. Like, for example, the first one I asked, who is responsible Right? Who will be responsible for the helipad? That was one of the questions that I asked. And also I asked, do we have a medical helicopter and who will own it? I think the answer that came back was concerning the best islands with Sabre and Station. They'll be paying for it and stuff. So I just want clarifications on that. Because I asked the question, is it that, that Sabre and Station will, will also will be flying there to pick them up, coming back here. How is that going to work? You know, so I was asking that question. Also, I also made mention about the, the helicopter not being able to use nowhere else because it can't land nowhere else. So if the minister could explain how is the, the flow of that is going to work. Just a few clarifications. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. I look to the minister <coughs> to see if he can go straight into the answering of the clarifications. Minister? You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to the clarification for MP Sarah Westcott Williams. The poverty study was indeed um, taking place. However, they lacked critical information needed by an updated census. Now that the census is completed, the poverty study, the, the aspect missing for the poverty study to be completed will now be able to take place. So that was missing. Number two, the question, I think MP Sarah Wesker had another clarification. The second clarification. MP Wesker? The who? Oh, yes, indeed, the health information system, it did um, 
the team uh, did ask the census for the death registration, but however, the information has not been forthcoming at this moment. Once we receive it, I can gladly present it tomorrow, <coughs> if need be. Um, as it pertains to MP Roseborough, what is currently being done, um, the ministry actually sent through staff bureaus, sent one, if through you, Madam Chair, from staff bureaus, sent one if it's um, policy workers for legal training and classes. Also, number two, which has been a great help to us, is our DCHA or Vlander um, agreements, whereby we utilize the legal minds of the different legal professionals of the four countries that helped us with mental health legislations and so forth. So that has been a great help. Um, as we move to the question of MP Emmanuel, who is responsible for the helipad, um, as stated, the best will be paying for the helipad and the helicopter. So yes, it is a, the intention to fly people from Saver and Stacia. You also asked a very critical question concerning the DCHA, the Dutch Caribbean Hospital Alliance, that all of that is intertwined in the reasoning why the best or the Netherlands side important to fund and incorporate a helipad. As it pertains to um, persons being transmitted from the hospital to the airport and then to save a station, that information, um, how it was sent to me is as if the heli helicopter will be flying direct. Um, I will have to seek clarification on this. But I do know this, uh, speaking from personal experience, um, even if it's from the hospital to the airport, that can, a helipad saves you a lot of time. I was uh, personally involved in an accident where a helipad save reached the facility, the hospital, in eight minutes, whereby the regular ambulance would have taken 45 minutes. So indeed, either way, it will cut down on time. So I think the intention is to cut down on the time to get the person transmitted to Save Us, Asia, or any of the Dutch Caribbean islands. So we, we just, through you, Madam Chair, um, MP Sarah Westcott, we received the 2022 registered mortality summary. summary. So that can be sent if you would like. So I know you asked for six years, but I'm just telling you what we recently received. And then we would try to gather the other information. Thank you, Minister Otley, for your answers to the clarifications from members of parliament. And uh, we'll await the sending of the documents tonight. I would now like to adjourn for three minutes while we change over ministers for the continuation of this meeting. Thank you. Meeting adjourned for three minutes.
Welcome back uh, to members of parliament. Um, in discussions, we will adjourn actually for a dinner break right now for 30 minutes. And then we, when we return, the prime minister will be here to answer the questions posed to her in the first round. So I will adjourn for 30 minutes. So we will return at 8.49 PM. Meeting adjourned.
Welcome back, members of parliament, uh, listening public, <clears throat> to this uh, public meeting on the handling of the country budget 2024. We're going to roll right into the answers to the questions posed by members of parliament in the first round by the Honorable Prime Minister. Prime Minister Jacobs, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Good evening to you, the members of parliament, Secretary General, people of St. Martin joining us at this hour for the responses. Thank you for joining us and for the opportunity to um, in the interest of time, be able to provide answers this evening. I will start immediately with the questions from MP Mingret. Can the minister provide an outline on all NRPB projects, the start date of the projects, guiding ministries, commitments, and the remaining balance per project? I did in my presentation give some dates, but I'll, I'll mention them again. The ERP-1 emergency recovery project started in July of 2018, and the ending date is slated for December 2025. The fund that was available is 119.7 million, and the remaining balance, therefore not yet disbursed, is 27.6 million. So we have until December 2025 to finish that. We have the de Emergency Debris Management Project, which is also known as the EDMP, which commenced on in December 2018 and will run until, as far as we know now, December 26, 2026. The amount budgeted was 85 and it has 55.9 left. As a matter of fact, that one was increased. Initially, it didn't have that much. That received additional financing. Just for the record, the Enterprise Support Project, also known as ESP, which services the small businesses and entrepreneurs who need funding, as well as training, started, commenced in April of 2019, and will run through December 2028, which gives us until 2025, December, for applications still. So there's still funding available for new businesses to request such. We started out with 25, and we've left now with 6.4 million for disbursement. So quite 19 million or so has already been disbursed. The airport terminal reconstruction project implemented together with PJIAE, including additional financing, was 92 million from the trust fund plus a 57 million co-financing with EIB as well as insurance proceeds, leaves only 26.9 to be disbursed at this point. And that one was implemented or started, the project started in August of 2019 and should end, be final. So usually when they have an end date is when um, you've already also given the room for, oh my God, I know there's a word, something qualities. Of, they have to do an assessment and there's a space for uh, where you can still hold the contractors accountable. So that ending date is like the date date when it's over. So then you can no longer call them in to fix X, Y, or Z based on their construction. Yeah? So don't think that that means a the airport will end that time. <laughs> There's just a time after the construction ends for that review to take place. Then we have the Fostering Resilience Learning Project, FRLP on the education is since 2021, February 2021. It runs until June 2025. It commenced with 26.8 million and still has 25.7. As you know, the schools still have to be built and that is slated to start during this year. But all of the 
preparation and everything else has been done. They're now moving into implementation and they have until, what did I say? 2025 to finish that. There is still room because the fund runs until 2028, if necessary, that that needs to be extended based on the late start. That can be done within the three years span left of the fund. We have the Digital Government Transformation Project, also known as DGTP, which commenced in January 2022, has until May 2025. We commenced with 12 million. We still have 9 million to go, 9.1. The Improving Mental Health Services, MHP, project started in August 2023 and has a duration until June 2027. It started with 8 million, and there's still 7.9 million to go. So quite some funds left to go. And I think I mentioned the Civil Society Partnership Facility that ends this year, so that money is done. They're actually requesting more funds. And these are areas, of course, within education, within planning, that you can look at how to continue to fund um, these and also with the facilities that we are being, we are getting with agreements with the Netherlands to have access to Groei funds and SDE plus funds. Some of these projects may be able to continue if we can access it via those portals and we're securing the agreements for those hopefully within the next month or two. So it could be this government, it could be with the next. We have those are the, that's the overview. I believe I covered all of the projects. Yes, that are ongoing. Then the member of, Gov member of parliament, Gums, asked or made some statements regarding resilience, which have already been addressed from my other function. <laughs> and, um, I can suffice it to say that we definitely want to move from constantly being resilient to thriving. So I totally agree with the Member of Parliament's stance as it regards to that. And um, planning, therefore, for disasters, future disasters is part of that. And improving our disaster management is part of that. But definitely out of having faced two disasters, I can say that Government of St. Martin has been paying more attention to the mental health of uh, after the hurricane, I can remember being education minister, commissioning uh, uh, an assessment of the mental health of not just the teachers and the social workers, persons dealing with the students, but of the students themselves. So, and then now since COVID that we are doing much more assessments and evaluation on mental health and government is currently providing some support in that area to its employees. So we hope in leading like that by example that the private sector would also do the same. MP Gums further asked, um, was flabbergasted, if I might quote Madam Chair, between the, by the responses from GEBE, re referring to grid markets, MOU with government. MP questioned, which track is being followed by GEBE, the grid market, or NRPB? And was GEBE involved in the discussions leading up to and after the signing of the MOU with Grid Market? Um, I believe in giving my responses several times in the past, I mentioned that the policy work group to which GEBE on paper belongs was not always, let's say, depending on which management of GEBE was in at the time, did not allow or have persons in those meetings. So as you know, we have an existing energy policy 2014, which needed to be revamped. That one had already put in a plan to go to renewable energy, which has not been met. And so it had to be updated, revised, et cetera, which the committee did and government commissioned grid market as an external, together with Island Resilience, to assess our situation to see what was needed. Of course, information from GEBE was needed pertaining to the grid, pertaining to capacity, pertaining to you know, 
pricing and all of this. And that, all of that information was not provided to be able to finalize the MOU. However, uh, what we did was took what was ready without that information. By then, we started to get GB on board. But GB had, by then, already started the process to, um, they were doing the underground cabling as part of the assistance from the trust fund. But secondly, something that had been available since 2019 was uh, assistance with a strategic plan, which they had not taken up. But with this management now, they saw the opportunity to do so, to get their grade properly assessed, capacity, et cetera, which they are doing. And they are, let's say, they're not using the roadmap as their guide, but based on what their assessment, which TNO and others are assisting them with, with via the NRPB, to ascertain what can be done, how much storage, et cetera, would be needed, they, we have requested as government that they take along the roadmap. So it doesn't mean that they have to use the company grid market to execute whatever they have to do, but to take along the roadmap, which is a plan towards renewable energy, which government has as part of its vision. And as a government-owned company, we expect that they would also do that and they, ha they are busy having their engineers assess the program. They've had meetings, but does it, that does not commit GB to quote unquote work with grid market. However, the roadmap is there to be used um, to get to where we want to go as government. I don't know if that's clear. If not, Madam Chair, would you want um, to request further clarity on that? How does that go? No? Interruptions in a lot, <laughs> not from the chair. Um, but should further uh, elucidation be needed, Madam Chair, um, I will attempt to put this in writing for you. The COLA adjustment, it was mentioned that the legislation to justify the adjustment was done, but um, was reached in Parliament? No, it has not yet reached the Parliament. I'm not sure if it's taken down correctly. But I can offer clarification on this point. Um, I did misspeak the last time. I did, via informal communication, tell the chair lady that she was indeed right in her observation that it wasn't an LBHAM, but indeed legislation for the 1% increase in vacation pay, as was mentioned during her remarks a few moments ago. So this is a national ordinance, and this will make its way to Parliament in due time. It's not there yet. It is currently at the Radford Advice for advice, and the cost of living adjustment of 2% is a national decree containing general measures, so I mixed up the two, um, and this too is by the Radford Advice. Once finalized, once they have rendered their advice, it then comes back to government and will follow the usual trajectory to get to government. Uh, hopefully in time for uh, the payment in July. Pay and owe, it was asked about leavers and joiners, the data from MP the Weaver. It is wondered whether the exit interviews are being done, which can identify trends in productivity and hopefully fix the data gap. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement, but I've taken note of MP De Weaver's request for information, observation as well, and um, indeed we are also from PNO and the B measures, um, completing assessments, exit surveys have been done in the meantime. We are extrapolating information from that to glean the reasons why persons have left of the group that we have. Um, have surveyed. But this was not done from the beginning. So exit service were not done all along. And even though we have reached out to several persons who had left within the last couple of years, not all responded. Because it is our goal to indeed fix the data gap where that is concerned and not just look at calendars to say this amount of people left, this amount of people came, 
we were lacking X amount of people and assuming the reason for having, not having the amount we needed. MP Helga Martin asks whether the Port of St. Martin was contacted to assist with the questions related to the fuel clause and the throughput fees. Minister of Tayat, while I was at the table, confirmed that yes, he did um, contact uh, the port, who confirmed that the rate didn't increase, as MP mentioned. MP further asked, has there been any escalation in the fuel clause over the past 10 years? And if so, how is it possible there's been, there's been no increases in the throughput fee while there has been an increase in the fuel clause? So while the throughput fee remained constant, the fuel clause did indeed fluctuate. Um, I believe this was already answered um, in the CC from the question of the Member of Parliament under 59G. Uh, however, the market differential, as was mentioned then, does influence the cost of fuel, which is outside the purview of government. So as the fluctuation in the market happens, so does the price of um, the fuel, the calculations in the fuel clause. I believe the answer that was given is that not all of the information related to the fuel clause could be diverged in this setting. Um, that's what I'm synopsizing from what was written at 59G, but the MP can look into it. Uh, she further asks if there, was an in, if there hasn't been an increase in throughput over the past 10 years, why was it that Prime Minister then made a claim that the fuel clause increased due to port fees? Now, I believe that is a misunderstanding because I don't recall saying that that was the cause. I'm saying that maybe the explanation wasn't received as I sent it. Um, in asking GEBE to address fuel, they mentioned that there is only one variable over which they feel we as government had some influence, which was the throughput fee, which goes through the port, and to check with the port whether that was possible. And once we ascertained from the port that it was part of their fixed income to be able to handle their loan agreements, it's not something that we as government can then say, okay, port, take it off, you know, don't charge it to GEBE to have a lowered fuel clause that would impact the community. So it is for that reason, that's how it was explained at the time, but maybe it wasn't clear enough. It is not saying that this is causing it to rise. No, the change in the market price fluctuations it was, is what causes the change in what is passed on to the consumer and in looking for a manner in which to decrease it at least by a tangible amount it was looked at as a possibility, but isn't possible. MP Manuel asked me to explain, excuse me, Madam Chair. <coughs> MP Manuel asked me to explain the difference between the Netherlands, Holland, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and to elucidate which one or explain which one of these states is St. Martin part of? I'll start with those two questions. Um, the Netherlands, Holland is the same, as far as I know. It's just a different name for the same country. The Kingdom of the Netherlands is the four countries, the Netherlands, St. Martin, Saint, uh, Curacao, and Aruba. So we have one country in Europe, and three countries or constituent states in the Caribbean. That can be debated as to how much of a country we are, which I also heard another MP mention. St. Martin is, as I mentioned, there are four together with Curacao and Aruba, a part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. If I might also clarify, Madam Chair, through you, to the MP, the public, is that I actually saw something written in the papers this week that said the Ministry of Foreign Affairs making statements about um, Dutch citizens in Haiti should uh, report their whereabouts, etc., because of the war, the fighting and the violence taking place in Haiti. That was not issued from St. Martin. 
that was issued from the Ministry of Bezet, Foreign Relations in the Netherlands, which based on our construct within the kingdom, there are certain things for which we are solely responsible for and other things for which the kingdom is responsible for. And the kingdom is responsible for foreign affairs as well as defense. So the Coast Guard is part of that whole defense package. So, and of course, the passport. So we have a kingdom passport. Um, I think I mentioned also before, in matters related within foreign relations that impact or can influence the Caribbean parts, we should be consulted and have a say etc. Um, I must say over the four years, initially things were just done. We would get a notification. The Kingdom Council of Ministers meets once per month, but the communication of documents sometimes comes the week of the Kingdom meeting. I think Madam Chair could relate to that timing. So we've always been challenged as to the amount of time to really respond to things on the kingdom level. And so we have technical discussions that happen, and sometimes they contact the different ministries, and of course the Ministry, excuse me, of General Affairs, the Foreign Relations Department, has to give us advice on treaties and different things to be able to respond how we feel it impacts St. Martin. So um, indeed, it doesn't always go as we would like, and we hear about things or it passed by quickly and it was missed. Nobody knows about it, uh, but it has improved over the last, say, couple of years, two years, that we are more involved in the discussions and even kingdom statements that are made sometimes <coughs> does take along our um, input and we have insisted also a little more there as well. As three countries together within the Caribbean. The, men, the MP mentioned about the mosque and also played a, a, a sound bite from, I believe, the Geert Wilders, uh, member of parliament Wilders, who is forming part of the group that is forming the government in the Netherlands, I believe as the largest party forming the government in the Netherlands, and um, has held some very strong right-wing views. Um, over the years, what um, in my communication with our plenipotentiary department or our plenipotentiary minister and their support staff is that they've noted, and also others within the Dutch political atmosphere, is they've noted quite a bit of a tempering of the statements coming from Mr. Wilders since the elections. Um, of course, going into a coalition as you say, your, your hard stance will have to bend. The, the art of compromise will have to be executed. And um, I do not believe even in the Netherlands that, that those statements would have broad support. The statements that you played on the floor, it definitely would not have support here on St. Martin, where we have lived in peace with over 100 nationals. Um, and nationalities and ethnicities, all of the ethnicities that exist in the world here on St. Martin. So indeed, I think I mentioned this before, the stance that was taken in terms of the motion from the Curacao Parliament, which was shared with all parliaments, including us in government, um, is one which we all agree with in a sense that anything you're saying that can have an impact on us, consult us as well because that's definitely not the stance here. And he definitely, I think you had a question, I'm not seeing it here, in terms of Mr. Wilders speaking for the Netherlands, in this case, even at any point, and not for the kingdom. Yeah? I hope that's clear. Good. And then there's a question about what the reason was for tell them buying cable TV and for how much, if it was to acquire the infrastructure, is it being used today? If not, how much is on the loss? How much is the loss on the books? Um, 
the infrastructure of cable TV is not being used? Isn't it the depth on the books to tell them? Why is the infrastructure not being used? What is the cost for purchasing St. Martin Cable TV? I believe we've answered this before, but the main reason that management at that time opted to buy cable TV was, I think, based, not I think, let me read what is here, was to keep the competitors out of the market that as they would be able to come into the market with limited investments. Unfortunately, shortly thereafter, the network was destroyed by Hurricane Irma and was not usable. I put it in words that are not there. Unfortunately, the network was destroyed by Hurricane Irma and not usable. It is not possible to calculate a loss in monetary value as cable TV services were integrated in telem services and is not calculated separately. The purchase price and the payout to staff was around $6 million. And if the honorable members of parliament would like an exact amount, this would be provided in writing. The MP further received a question on preclearance being off the books or made a statement, I don't know, question on whether or not preclearance was off the books. Is there any intention whatsoever in terms of going after preclearance? Is it so that the US pulled back and why? I do believe I answered this question as well on more than one occasion. In March of 2022, the US government via the Consul General in Curacao made it very clear to the government of St. Martin that U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CPB, will not be proceeding with preclearance with the country for now. The pause in preclearance is based on the U.S. CPB's budgetary constraints coupled with current national security priorities, which at the time were centered around their border protection related to Mexico um, and the challenges they faced there. So especially post-COVID, et cetera, they weren't really looking to expand because it would also be a cost to them. Um, so this is something that will and can be revisited because it remained a part of this outgoing government's, um, let's say, part of our agenda. And I'm sure the incoming government will then have to decide whether that's something they will pursue whether CPB is ready to do so, when CPB is ready to do so. But I think I remember also mentioning, Madam Chair, that there are other financial requirements that would go along with that, which would include also expansion of the airport, further expansion of the airport to accommodate, and the understanding that wherever they are located would be the United States within St. Martin. So all of the, you know, we've just started to be able to issue um, special permissions for UNOPS and World Bank and others to have the immunities that come along with it. This would include all of those immunities and all of those um, benefits being extended to the persons, all of the persons and their families that would then be living on St. Martin in that special circumstance. MP Roseburg asked whether GB has a hindrance permit and as well about other government owned companies. Um, this is a question I don't have the answer for at the moment, um, but I have asked I have asked the Ministry of Romi to, they were the ones that issue hindrance permits to follow up on this question as well. So hopefully tomorrow you get a better idea of which government owned companies have or do not have hindrance permits. The MP further mentioned that she's hearing nonstop that ministers mentioned that there's a lack of legal expertise on the island what has the current government been doing to attract legal minds to government or to St. Martin and so that the le lack of legal expertise can be tackled? Uh, Madam Chair, through you, one of the reform initiatives under the B measures pertains to the strengthening of the legislative functions. 
Based on an integrated detail review, proposals will be developed and implemented with a focus on improving the quality, effectiveness, and implementation capacity of the government organization, which will also include the effectiveness of ministerial staff. As a matter of fact, policy advisors and legislative lawyers from all the different ministries and the cabinet of ministers, totaling some 13 persons, traveled to Curacao recently, March 20th to 22nd, to attend the legal event sponsored by BZK Terio. Our advisors, as a part of that trajectory, our advisors and legal experts met with the colleagues from the other countries during workshops to discuss matters such as AI and legislation and how to um, write elucidations and more to kind of synchronize that across the board so that we could share information and collaborate as much as possible on legislation that was similar or the same. The feedback received was that the knowledge and the network was considered, were considered useful for the day-to-day -day legal slash legislative practice in government and challenges while dealing with legal aspects of the reform measures within the country packages. The Council of Ministers has supported and invested in courses as well as personal development for the past four years and hopes that this will continue. So even though in other areas we did lack training, several, I think I mentioned this in one or two other budget meetings before, um, I think up to six, legislative lawyers were trained over the last couple of years with the challenge that once trained, <laughs> they ended up either going from legal affairs to a direct ministry or leaving the island completely, which um, the last set, I must say that I included within their study contract that they would remain on island for minimum three years so that we would, could recoup that investment. Um, the recruitment, however, of legal personnel continues. As you know, we did have um, St. Martin taking part in the career fair in the Netherlands, career beurs. And we have noted though with, let's say when we put out for these functions, that though people show interest, once they see the remuneration and or benefits, they're not that turned on, seeing that the cost of living on St. Martin is higher than in the other Caribbean islands. So we are looking at, with that, also part of the B measures in assessing market value and so on, really addressing the challenge we have with the manner in which we remunerate, um, especially persons at that level. So our survey did show, our assessment and research did show that the professional um, functions within government the remuneration does not compare well with the other Caribbean islands. So once they have the capacity, they will get better money in Curacao, Aruba, Gladstan, Bonaire, where it's dollars. So that competition is just the reality of the day. So we have to pay better, so we need budget for that. <laughs> and the legislative trajectory to change the scales as well. And Peter Weaver asked about personnel budget actual, well, that was mentioned earlier. Um, as was mentioned, this will be provided in writing. But I do feel a need to emphasize, I said, I think I was starting to mention it above by another MP's questions, I can't recall which at the moment. But the quantitative data that is being requested um, will show some type of trend, but it wouldn't explain the why as I mentioned earlier, in terms of why there are levers or why there are gaps. Um, in the past, we have made many assumptions based on accounts from different persons, and that is why we commissioned the exit survey and the employee satisfaction survey as well as the market position research so we can ascertain the real reasons to some degree and as to why there was a perceived exodus of persons from government's employment. The result has confirmed some of our previous conclusions, but more importantly, has offered the opportunity via tangible recommendations to work on the improvements as I have explained previously. MP Westcott Williams asked 
MP Westcott Williams made several statements related to the amount of times digitalization appeared in the budget, whether government has a strategy where digitalization is concerned, and is that even in the talks about digitalization, are there any priority sectors in this area? Is this government at all involved in talks with UNESCO AI Caribbean Initiative? And there was a lot also said about AI in general. There is, of course, a digital strategy. Um, and I think that also shows within the budget that government is serious about digitalization. The strategy was approved by the Council of Ministers in 2022. I think in reading the overview for, that MP Mingret requested, I mentioned when it started, it started in 2022 with our approval, <coughs> as well as a general roadmap of activities or milestones that were envisioned. This document can be shared with the Parliament. While we are aware of the UNESCO AI initiative, and are monitoring the activities, it is important to note that the importance of government establishing foundational building blocks, electronic ID, interoperability, and e-signature. And to explain quickly, everyone would know what electronic ID is, um, having that unique ID per uh, individual, but also the interoperability is to allow the different systems to communicate with each other. That is key to realize the efficiency needed with, so just not internal in your department or ministry, but interministerially as well, so that we can minimize the time, the effort, et cetera, to be able to serve the public. And e-signature, of course, that speaks for itself. Um, legislation is also needed. That has been ascertained, and so that is built into the roadmap as well. <clears throat> And these building blocks are necessary to, prior to further advancements. They will be delivered under the Digital Government Transformation Project, DGTP. The roadmap includes six core principles and four basic objectives for sustainable implementation. When developing this roadmap, internal as well as external stakeholders were consulted, included the General Audit Chamber, SSV, TALEM, Central Bank of Curaçao and St. Martin, APS, GEBE, to just mention a few. So uh, as I mentioned before, the document can be provided if necessary to the members of parliament. List of agreements with the French side. There are agreements with the French side in several areas. Oh, I forgot to mention it wasn't written. But there are also activities that are part of the reform measures that require the revamping of the ICD, ICT department and ensuring that they are able to do what is necessary to support the whole digitalization process. Including our CAPEX, which then serves for the products, et cetera, that we would need to purchase hardware, software, and provide for training for our staff. Now to the Agreements with the French side. There are several agreements outside of the treaty with the French side in several areas. The Border Treaty, which was uh, signed in 2023. It clarifies the Treaty of Concordia. It demarcates the border as well as sets a legal basis for a joint border commission and a joint cooperation platform. That is in the process of ratification, and the ministry that was dealing with that is the Ministry of General Affairs. There is a letter of intent on education also in 2023, which is cooperation and exchange in education and sports, and that is under the Ministry of ECYS. There is an MOU on drinking water 2023, which has the modalities for assistance in provision of drinking water from Dutch to French side at a cost and that is via the Ministry of VSR. There is a letter of intent on maritime pursuit, hot pursuit, 2023, to manage movement of law enforcement across the maritime border. As you know, our border runs from Kupukoi to lowlands, and that is the area where the Dutch uh, Caribbean Coast Guard can traverse. 
Um, if there is then a, a chase that enters into French waters, I probably shouldn't say this here, <laughs> there's a challenge for the continuation, and so we are um, finalizing the agreements so that that pursuit can continue to mitigate and ensure protection of the complete St. Martin border. This is in collaboration with Justice, and there's an accompanying operational protocol that comes with that. There is the police treaty and police agreement of 2010, which is the presence of authorities at our ports of entry. That's with Ministry of Justice. There's a state status of forces agreement in 20, sorry, I missed one. There's another police agreement from 2017 on matters of cooperation and training with the Ministry of Justice. There's a status of forces agreement, 2023 regulates defenses, forces on the sovereign territory of the other, that is between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Foreign Relations in the Netherlands. Um, that one is where they regulate as part of their purview. There are the civil avi aviation agreements, which vary several existing agreements with the French state to facilitate transport. Uh, that's with the Ministry of Teat. There's health agreement. That's a cooperation between the hospitals, which is in the process of being updated. <clears throat> Ministry of VSA and St. Martin Medical Center. And there's a firefighting agreement. One was signed in 96 and one was signed in 2018, which is the cooperation on, with the firefighting authorities, AZ, is the one the ministry generally uh, charged with that. But I must say, most of the cooperation, there is also continued cooperation in youth, besides education and sports, also with the youth departments. Um, and a lot of the cooperations happen even when there is no written. So there's a lot of gentleman agreements as well. So when you heard during those speeches the need to upgrade the Treaty of Concordia, it is more to define more clearly all these other MOUs, letters of intent in actual treaties and getting them, you know, all formalized. <coughs> Technical cooperation exists in areas of waste, in areas of energy, disaster preparedness, and meteorologi meteorology, fishing, and telecom. And it is the intention with the assistance of our foreign affairs department and the relevant ministries to formalize these as well. Also other identified areas for future collaborations which we signed back in 2023 with our counterparts at the Q4 meeting in The Hague is to further explore uh, ways to collaborate in crisis management, regulation of our tri-nation maritime uh, transport together with Anguilla, St. Martin, St. Barts, and customs, prevention of social fraud, extradition, and taxation. And with that, I've come to the end of the questions as were noted by our staff, and I hope with that that we're able to respond to all the questions. Thank you, Prime Minister Jacobs. I look to the members of parliament for those who may have clarifications, and thus far I have one request for clarification from MP Ludmila de Weaver. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady, and thank you, Prime Minister, for the answers. Just really quickly, um, when the, referring to the question about grid market, um, I was trying to look in the budget to see if there was a place where you reserve for any litigation that might come up, right? Because normally what happens is if you have an anticipation that something is going to be taken, a legal, a, legal, like a legal process is going to be started with it, that there is a place in the budget for it. So it has come to my attention, based on the answers that we got about grid market, that GB is not participating, that it's an MOU potentially that they might start to sue government with. It's happened in the past. Um, I believe it was bearing point, but it's happened in the past, so I just want to know if that is indeed the case via you, Madam Chair, Lady, to the Prime Minister, and if we have to prepare for uh, reserving for uh, you know, like legal funds, basically. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP De Weaver. I'll just let, because uh, we have uh, MP Sarah Westcott-Williams also requesting clarification. MP Westcott-Williams, you have the floor. Uh, 
Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. And just briefly to the Prime Minister, thank you for those answers. And I'm not sure whether the Prime Minister indicated that there is a new or revised energy policy from the one 2014. The Prime Minister kind of went over it quickly. So is the new policy there? Is the revised energy policy there? And um, the Prime Minister, Madam Chair Lady, referred to a roadmap in that context as well. And um, if these documents are there, if these can be shared. So can the updated energy policy, if it is already finished, um, if that, or finalized, if that can be shared. The Prime Minister indicated that the digital strategy is, is here, is, av is available if necessary, and I would like to affirm that that is. So if it can be shared as well as a roadmap referred to by the Prime Minister in that context, digital strategy as well. Um, thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. I look to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, can you go right into the answering or would you need some time? Right to the answering? Okay. Prime Minister, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to further clarify to MP the Weaver through you, um, no, I don't expect litigation in this regard. A grid market carried out what was agreed upon with the MOU. Um, of course, it would require if uh, there was the option that they would be able to assist in the execution thereof, but there is no guarantee that was established within the MOU, so I don't see that as a litigation a possibility at this stage. Um, but I mentioned that it is government's roadmap, so they carried out a research on behalf of government. So we continue to say grid market, but it is government's roadmap. And it has been shared with NVGEBE, and it is to be taken along from our perspective as government um, in what plans come out of the results of the TNO research that is being done with the assistance of the funding and expertise that has been garnered via the NRPB and the trust fund. Um, the roadmap, as was mentioned, is that is what came out of what was procured via uh, Grid Market. And I believe it was shared already with Parliament, but if not, um, and the Khrifi can confirm, then it will be shared as it relates to the digital strategy and that roadmap that will be shared. Hopefully by tomorrow, for when Parliament resumes. If there's nothing further, Thank you, uh, Prime Minister. Okay. Members of Parliament, with that, um, for tonight, uh, we have come to, well, the end of tonight. And uh, I thank the Prime Minister for her answers. We will be reconvening this meeting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So I hereby adjourn this meeting until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>